His Last Bow Preface This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Preface The friends of Mr. Sherlock Holmes will be glad to learn that he is still alive and well, though somewhat crippled by occasional attacks of rheumatism. He has, for many years, lived in a small farm upon the downs five miles from Eastbourne, where his time is divided between philosophy and agriculture. During this period of rest he has refused the most princely offers to take up various cases, having determined that his retirement was a permanent one. The approach of the German war caused him, however, to lay his remarkable combination of intellectual and practical activity at the disposal of the government, with historical results which are recounted in his last bow. Several previous experiences, which have lain long in my portfolio, have been added to his last bow, so as to complete the volume. John H. Watson, M.D. End of Preface Section 1 of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 1. Wisteria Lodge. Part 1. The Singular Experience of Mr. John Scott Eccles. Dr. Watson read by Corrie Samuel. Sherlock Holmes read by Beth Thomas. John Scott Eccles read by Nick Richmond. Inspector Baines read by Kevin Blake. Inspector Gregson read by James Callahan. Warner, read by Norman Elfer. Walters, read by Brian Mansey. Miss Burnett, read by Charter. I find it recorded in my notebook that it was a bleak and windy day towards the end of March, in the year 1892. Holmes had received a telegram while we sat at our lunch, and he had scribbled a reply. He made no remark but the matter remained in his thoughts, for he stood in front of the fire afterwards with a thoughtful face, smoking his pipe and casting an occasional glance at the message. Suddenly he turned upon me with a mischievous twinkle in his eyes. "'I suppose, Watson, we must look upon you as a man of letters,' said he. "'How do you define the word grotesque?' "'Strange, remarkable,' I suggested. He shook his head at my definition. "'There is surely something more than that,' said he. "'Some underlying suggestion of the tragic and the terrible. If you cast your mind back to some of those narratives with which you have afflicted a long-suffering public, you will recognise how often the grotesque has deepened into the criminal. Think of that little affair of the red-headed men. That was grotesque enough in the outset, and yet it ended in a desperate attempt at robbery.' or again there was that most grotesque affair of the five orange pips which led straight to a murderous conspiracy the word puts me on the alert have you it there i asked he read the telegram aloud have just had the most incredible and grotesque experience may i consult you scott eccles post office charing cross man or woman i asked oh man of course no woman would ever send a reply paid telegram she would have come will you see him my dear watson you know how bored i have been since we locked up colonel carruthers my mind is like a racing engine tearing itself to pieces because it is not connected up with the work for which it was built life is commonplace the papers are sterile audacity and romance seem to have passed for ever from the criminal world can you ask me then whether i am ready to look into any new problem however trivial it may prove but here unless i am mistaken is our client a measured step was heard upon the stairs and a moment later a stout tall grey-whiskered and solemnly respectable person was ushered into the room his life history was written in his heavy features and pompous manner from his spat to his gold-rimmed spectacles he was conservative a churchman, a good citizen, orthodox and conventional to the last degree. But some amazing experience had disturbed his native composure, and left its traces in his bristling hair, his flushed, angry cheeks, 
and his flurried, excited manner. He plunged instantly into his business. "'I have had a most singular and unpleasant experience, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'Never in my life have I been placed in such a situation. It's most improper, most outrageous. I must insist upon some explanation.' He swelled and puffed in his anger. "'Pray sit down, Mr. Scott Eccles,' said Holmes in a soothing voice. "'May I ask, in the first place, why you came to me at all?' "'Well, sir, it did not appear to be a matter which concerned the police. And yet, when you have heard the facts, you must admit that I could not leave it where it was. Private detectives are a class with whom I have absolutely no sympathy, but none the less, having heard your name. Quite so. But in the second place, why did you not come at once? What do you mean? Holmes glanced at his watch. It is a quarter past two, he said. Your telegram was dispatched about one, but no one can glance at your toilet and attire without seeing that your disturbance dates from the moment of your waking. Our client smoothed down his unbrushed hair and felt his unshaven chin. "'You are right, Mr. Holmes. I never gave a thought to my toilet. I was only too glad to get out of such a house. But I have been running around making inquiries before I came to you. I went to the house agents, you know, and they said that Mr. Garcia's rent was paid up all right, and that everything was in order at Wisteria Lodge.' "'Come, come, sir,' said Holmes, laughing. "'You are like my friend, Dr. Watson, who has a bad habit of telling his stories wrong end foremost. Please arrange your thoughts and let me know, in their due sequence, exactly what those events are which have sent you out unbrushed and unkempt, with dress boots and waistcoat buttoned awry, in search of advice and assistance.' Our client looked down with a rueful face at his own unconventional appearance. I'm sure it must look very bad, Mr. Holmes, and I'm not aware that in my whole life such a thing has ever happened before. But I will tell you the whole queer business, and when I have done, so you will admit I am sure there has been enough to excuse me. But his narrative was nipped in the bud. There was a bustle outside and Mrs. Hudson opened the door to usher in two robust and official-looking individuals, one of whom was well known to us as Inspector Gregson of Scotland Yard, an energetic, gallant, and, within his limitations, a capable officer. He shook hands with Holmes and introduced his comrade as Inspector Baines of the Surrey Constabulary. "'We are hunting together, Mr. Holmes, and our trail lay in this direction.' He turned his bulldog eyes upon our visitor. Are you Mr. John Scott Eccles of Popham House, Lee? I am. We have been following you about all the morning. You traced him through the telegram, no doubt, said Holmes. Exactly, Mr. Holmes. We picked up the scent at Charing Cross Post Office and came on here. But why do you follow me? What do you want? We wish a statement, Mr. Scott Eccles. As to the events which led up to the death last night of Mr. Aloysius Garcia of Wisteria Lodge near Isha. Our client had sat up with staring eyes and every tinge of colour struck from his astonished face. Dead? Did you say he was dead? Yes, sir, he is dead. But how? An accident? Murder, if ever there was one upon earth. Good God, this is awful. You don't mean... you don't mean that I am suspected? A letter of yours was found in the dead man's pocket, and we know by it that you had planned to pass last night at his house. So I did. Oh, you did, did you? Out came the official notebook. Oh, wait a bit, Gregson, said Sherlock Holmes. All you desire is a plain statement, is it not? And it is my duty to warn Mr. Scott Eccles that it may be used against him. Mr. Eccles was going to tell us about it when you entered the room. I think, Watson, a brandy and soda would do him no harm. 
now sir i suggest that you take no notice of this addition to your audience and that you proceed with your narrative exactly as you would have done had you never been interrupted our visitor had gulped off the brandy and the colour had returned to his face with a dubious glance at the inspector's notebook he plunged at once into his extraordinary statement i am a bachelor said he and being of a sociable turn i cultivate a large number of friends among these are the family of a retired brewer called melville living at abermarl mansion kensington it was at his table that i met some weeks ago a young fellow named garcia he was i understand of spanish descent and connected in some way with the embassy he spoke perfect english and was pleasing in his manners and as good-looking a man as i ever saw in my life in some way we struck up quite a friendship this young fellow and i he seemed to take a fancy to me from the first and within two days of our meeting he came to see me at lee one thing led to another and it ended in his inviting me out to spend a few days at his house wisteria lodge between isher and oxshot yesterday evening i went to isher to fulfil this engagement he had described his household to me before i went there he lived with a faithful servant a countryman of his own who looked after all his needs this fellow could speak english and did his housekeeping for him then there was a wonderful cook he said a half-breed whom he had picked up in his travels who could serve an excellent dinner i remember that he remarked what a queer household it was to find in the heart of surrey and that i agreed with him though it has proved a good deal queerer than i thought i drove to the place about two miles on the south side of isha the house was a fair-sized one standing back down from the road with a curving drive which was banked with high evergreen shrubs it was an old tumble-down building in a crazy state of disrepair when the trap pulled up on the grass-grown drive in front of the blotched and weather-stained door i had doubts as to my wisdom in visiting a man whom i knew so slightly he opened the door himself however and greeted me with a great show of cordiality i was handed over to the manservant a melancholy swarthy individual who led the way my bag in his hand to my bedroom the whole place was depressing our dinner was tete a tete and though my host did his best to be entertaining his thoughts seemed to continually wander and he talked so vaguely and wildly that i could hardly understand him he continually drummed his fingers on the table gnawed his nails and gave other signs of nervous impatience the dinner itself was neither well served nor well cooked and the gloomy presence of the taciturn servant did not help to enliven us i can assure you that many times in the course of the evening i wish that i could invent some excuse which would take me back to lee one thing comes back to my memory which may have a bearing upon the business that you two gentlemen are investigating i thought nothing of it at the time near the end of the dinner a note was handed in by the servant i noticed that after my host had read it he seemed even more distrait and strange than before he gave up all pretence at conversation and sat smoking endless cigarettes lost in his own thoughts but he made no remark as to the contents about eleven i was glad to go to bed some time later garcia looked in at my door the room was dark at the time and asked me if i had rung i said that i had not he apologized for having disturbed me so late saying that it was nearly one o'clock i dropped off after this and slept soundly all night and now i come to the amazing part of my tale when i woke it was broad daylight i glanced at my watch and the time was nearly nine 
i had particularly asked to be called at eight so i was very much astonished at this forgetfulness i sprang up and rang for the servant there was no response i rang again and again with the same result then i came to the conclusion that the bell was out of order i huddled on my clothes and hurried downstairs in an exceedingly bad temper to order some hot water you can imagine my surprise when i found that there was no one there i shouted in the hall there was no answer then i ran from room to room all were deserted my host had shown me which was his bedroom the night before so i knocked at the door no reply i turned the handle and walked in the room was empty and the bed had never been slept in he had gone with the rest the foreign host the foreign footman the foreign cook all had vanished in the night that was the end of my visit to wisteria lodge sherlock holmes was rubbing his hands and chuckling as he added this bizarre incident to his collection of strange episodes your experience is so far as i know perfectly unique said he may i ask sir what you did then i was furious my first idea was that i had been the victim of some absurd practical joke i packed my things banged the hall door behind me and set off for isha with my bag in my hand i called at allen brothers the chief land agents in the village and found that it was from this firm that the villa had been rented it struck me that the whole proceeding could hardly be for the purpose of making a fool of me and that the main object must be to get out of the rent it is late in march so quarter day is at hand but this theory would not work the agent was obliged to me for my warning but told me that the rent had been paid in advance then i made my way to town and called at the spanish embassy the man was unknown there after this i went to see melville at whose house i had first met garcia but i found that he really knew rather less about him than i did finally when i got your reply to my wire i came out to you since i gather that you are a person who gives advice in difficult cases but now mr inspector i understand from what you said when you entered the room that you can carry the story on and that some tragedy had occurred i can assure you that every word i have said is the truth and that outside of what i have told you i know absolutely nothing about the fate of this man my only desire is to help the law in every possible way i am sure of it mr scott eccles i am sure of it said inspector gregson in a very amiable tone i am bound to say that everything which you have said agrees very closely with the facts as they have come to our notice for example there was that note which arrived during dinner did you chance to observe what became of it yes i did garcia rolled it up and threw it into the fire what do you say to that mr baines the country detective was a stout puffy red man whose face was only redeemed from grossness by two extraordinarily bright eyes, almost hidden behind the heavy creases of cheek and brow. With a slow smile he drew a folded and discoloured scrap of paper from his pocket. It was a dog grate, Mr. Holmes, and he overpitched it. I picked this out unburned from the back of it. Holmes smiled his appreciation. You must have examined the house very carefully to find a single pellet of paper. I did, Mr. Rams. It's my way. Shall I read it, Mr. Gregson? The Londoner nodded. The note is written upon ordinary cream-laid paper without watermark. It's a quarter sheet. The paper is cut in two snips with a short-bladed scissors. It's been folded over three times and sealed with purple wax, put on hurriedly and pressed down with some flat oval object. It's addressed to Mr. Garcia, Wisteria Lodge. It says, Our own colours, green and white, Green open, white shut. Main stair, first corridor, seventh right, 
Green bays. Godspeed. D. It's a woman's writing, done with a sharp pointed pen, but the address is either done with another pen or by someone else. It's thicker and bolder, as you see. A very remarkable note, said Holmes, glancing it over. I must compliment you, Mr. Baines, upon your attention to detail and your examination of it. A few trifling points might perhaps be added. The oval seal is undoubtedly a plain sleeve link. What else is of such a shape? The scissors were bent nail scissors. Short as the two snips are, you can distinctly see the same slight curve in each. The country detective chuckled. I thought I had squeezed all the juice out of it, but I see there was a little over, he said. I'm bound to say I make nothing of the note except that there was something on hand, and that a woman, as usual, was at the bottom of it. Mr. Scott Eccles had fidgeted in his seat during this conversation. I'm glad you found the note, since it corroborates my story, said he. But I beg to point out that I have not yet heard what has happened to Mr. Garcia, nor what became of his household. "'As to Garcia,' said Gregson, "'that is easily answered. He was found dead this morning upon Oxshot Common, nearly a mile from his home. His head had been smashed to pulp by heavy blows of a sandbag or some such instrument, which had crushed rather than wounded. It is a lonely corner, and there is no house within a quarter of a mile of the spot. He had apparently been struck down first from behind, but his assailant had gone on beating him long after he was dead.' It was a most furious assault. There are no footsteps nor any clue to the criminals. Robbed? No, there was no attempt at robbery. This is very painful. Very painful and terrible, said Mr. Scott Eccles in a querulous voice. But it is really uncommonly hard on me. I had nothing to do with my host going off upon a nocturnal excursion and meeting so sad an end. How do I come to be mixed up with this case? Very simple, sir, Inspector Baines answered. The only document found in the pocket of the deceased was a letter from you saying that you would be with him on the night of his death. It was the envelope of this letter which gave us the dead man's name and address. It was after nine this morning when we reached his house and found neither you nor anyone else inside it. I wired to Mr. Gregson to run you down in London while I examined Wisteria Lodge. Then I came into town, joined Mr. Gregson, and here we are. I think now, said Gregson, rising, we had best put this matter into an official shape. You will come round with us to the station, Mr. Scott Eccles, and let us have your statement in writing. Certainly, I will come at once. But I retain your services, Mr. Holmes. I desire you to spare no expense, and no pains to get at the truth. My friend turned to the country inspector. I suppose that you have no objection to my collaborating with you, Mr. Baines? Highly honoured, sir, I'm sure. You appear to have been very prompt and businesslike in all that you have done. Was there any clue, may I ask, as to the exact hour that the man met his death? He had been there since one o'clock. There was rain about that time, and his death had certainly been before the rain. But that is perfectly impossible, Mr. Baines, cried our client. His voice is unmistakable. I could swear to it that it was he who addressed me in my bedroom at that very hour. Remarkable, but by no means impossible, said Holmes, smiling. "'You have a clue?' asked Gregson. "'On the face of it, the case is not a very complex one, "'though it certainly presents some novel and interesting features. "'A further knowledge of facts is necessary "'before I would venture to give a final and definite opinion. "'By the way, Mr. Baines, did you find anything remarkable "'besides this note in your examination of the house?' "'The detective looked at my friend in a singular way. "'There were,' said he, "'one or two very remarkable things.' Perhaps when I finish at the police station, you'd care to come out and give me your opinion of them. I am entirely at your service, said Sherlock Holmes, ringing the bell. You will show these gentlemen out, Mrs. Hudson, and kindly send the boy with this telegram. He is to pay a five-shilling reply. We sat for some time in silence after our visitors had left. Holmes smoked hard, with his brows drawn down over his keen eyes, 
and his head thrust forward in the eager way characteristic of the man. "'Well, Watson,' he asked, turning suddenly upon me, "'what do you make of it?' "'I can make nothing of this mystification of Scott Eccles.' "'But the crime?' "'Well, taken with the disappearance of the man's companions, I should say that they were in some way concerned in the murder and had fled from justice that is certainly a possible point of view on the face of it you must admit however that it is very strange that his two servants should have been in a conspiracy against him and should have attacked him on the one night when he had a guest they had him alone at their mercy every other night of the week then why did they fly quite so why did they fly there is a big fact another big fact is the remarkable experience of our client scott eccles now my dear watson is it beyond the limits of human ingenuity to furnish an explanation which would cover both of these big facts if it were one which would also admit of the mysterious note with its very curious phraseology why then it would be worth accepting as a temporary hypothesis if the fresh facts which come to our knowledge all fit themselves into the scheme then our hypothesis may gradually become a solution but what is our hypothesis Holmes leaned back in his chair with half-closed eyes. "'You must admit, my dear Watson, that the idea of a joke is impossible. There were grave events afoot, as the sequel showed, and the coaxing of Scott Eccles to Wisteria Lodge had some connection with them.' "'But what possible connection?' "'Let us take it link by link. There is, on the face of it, something unnatural about this strange and sudden friendship between the young Spaniard and Scott Eccles.' it was the former who forced the pace he called upon eccles at the other end of london on the very day after he first met him and kept in close touch with him until he got him down to esher now what did he want with eccles what could eccles supply i see no charm in the man he is not particularly intelligent not a man likely to be congenial to a quick-witted latin why then was he picked out from all the other people whom garcia met as particularly suited to his purpose has he any one outstanding quality i say that he has he is the very type of conventional british respectability and the very man as a witness to impress another briton you saw yourself how neither of the inspectors dreamed of questioning his statement extraordinary as it was but what was he to witness nothing as things turned out but everything had they gone another way that is how i read the matter i see he might have proved an alibi exactly my dear watson he might have proved an alibi we will suppose for argument's sake that the household of wisteria lodge are confederates in some design the attempt whatever it may be is to come off we will say before one o'clock by some juggling of the clocks it is quite possible that they may have got scott eccles to bed earlier than he thought but in any case it is likely that when garcia went out of his way to tell him that it was one it was really not more than twelve if garcia could do whatever he had to do and be back by the hour mentioned he had evidently a powerful reply to any accusation here was this irreproachable englishman ready to swear in any court of law that the accused was in his house all the time it was an insurance against the worst yes yes i see that but how about the disappearance of the others i have not all my facts yet but i do not think there are any insuperable difficulties still it is an error to argue in front of your data you find yourself insensibly twisting them round to fit your theories and the message how did it run our own colours green and white sounds like racing green open white shut that is clearly a signal main stair first corridor seventh right green bays this is an assignation we may find a jealous husband at the bottom of it all it was clearly a dangerous quest she would not have said god speed had it not been so d that should be a guide the man was a spaniard i suggest that d stands for dolores a common female name in spain good watson very good but quite inadmissible a spaniard would write to a spaniard in spanish the writer of this note is certainly english well we can only possess our souls in patience until this excellent inspector comes back for us meanwhile we can thank our lucky fate which has rescued us for a few short hours from the insufferable fatigues of idleness 
An answer had arrived to Holmes's telegram before our Surrey officer had returned. Holmes read it, and was about to place it in his notebook when he caught a glimpse of my expectant face. He tossed it across with a laugh. "'We are moving in exalted circles,' said he. The telegram was a list of names and addresses. "'Lord Harringby, the Dingle. Sir George Folliot, Oxshott Towers. Mr. Hines Hines, J. P. Purdy Place. Mr. James Baker Williams, Forton Old Hall. Mr. Henderson, High Gable. Reverend Joshua Stone, Nether Walsling. This is a very obvious way of limiting our field of operations, said Holmes. No doubt Baines, with his methodical mind, has already adopted some similar plan. I don't quite understand. Well, my dear fellow, we have already arrived at the conclusion that the message received by Garcia at dinner was an appointment or an assignation. Now, if the obvious reading of it is correct, and in order to keep this tryst one has to ascend a main stair and seek the seventh door in a corridor, it is perfectly clear that the house is a very large one. It is equally certain that this house cannot be more than a mile or two from Oxshott, since Garcia was walking in that direction, and hoped, according to my reading of the facts, to be back in Wisteria Lodge in time to avail himself of an alibi, which would only be valid up to one o'clock. As the number of large houses close to Oxshott must be limited, I adopted the obvious method of sending to the agents mentioned by Scott Eccles and obtaining a list of them. Here they are in this telegram and the other end of our tangled skein must lie among them it was nearly six o'clock before we found ourselves in the pretty surrey village of isha with inspector baines as our companion holmes and i had taken things for the night and found comfortable quarters at the bull finally we set out in the company of the detective on our visit to wisteria lodge it was a cold dark march evening with a sharp wind and a fine rain beating upon our faces a fit setting for the wild common over which our road passed, and the tragic goal to which it led us. End of section one. Section two of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two. Wisteria Lodge, Part Two, The Tiger of San Pedro. A cold and melancholy walk of a couple of miles brought us to a high wooden gate, which opened into a gloomy avenue of chestnuts. The curved and shadowed drive led us to a low, dark house, pitch black against a slate-coloured sky. From the front window upon the left of the door there peeped a glimmer of a feeble light. There's a constable in possession said Baines. I'll knock at the window. He stepped across the grass plot and tapped with his hand on the pane. Through the fogged glass I dimly saw a man spring up from a chair beside the fire and heard a sharp cry from within the room. An instant later a white-faced, hard-breathing policeman had opened the door, the candle wavering in his trembling hand. What's the matter, Walters? asked Baines sharply. The man mopped his forehead with his handkerchief and gave a long sigh of relief. "'I'm glad you've come, sir. It has been a long evening, and I don't think my nerve is as good as it was.' <laughs> "'Your nerve, Walters? I should not have thought you had a nerve in your body.' "'Well, sir, it's this lonely, silent house, and the queer thing in the kitchen. Then when you tapped at the window, I thought it had come again.' "'That what had come again?' The devil, sir, for all I know. It was at the window. What was at the window, and when? It was just about two hours ago. The light was just fading. I was sitting reading in the chair. I didn't know what made me look up, but there was a face looking in at me through the lower pane. Lord, sir, what a face it was. I'll see it in my dreams. Tut tut, Walters. This is not the talk for a police constable. I know, sir, I know. But it shook me, sir. And there's no use to deny it. It wasn't black, sir. Nor was it white. Nor any colour that I know. But a kind of queer shade like clay with a splash of milk in it. Then there was the size of it. 
It was twice yours, sir. And the look of it, the great staring goggle eyes, and the line of white teeth like a hungry beast. I tell you, sir, I couldn't move a finger, nor get my breath, till it whisked away and was gone. Out I ran through the shrubbery, but thank God there was no one there. If I didn't know you were a good man, Walters, I should put a black mark against you for this. If it were the devil himself, a constable on duty should never thank God that he could not lay his hands upon him. I, I suppose the whole thing is not a vision, but a touch of nerves. That, at least, is very easily settled, said Holmes, lighting his little pocket lantern. Yes, he reported, after a short examination of the grass bed. A number twelve shoe, I should say. If he was all on the same scale as his foot, he must certainly have been a giant. What became of him? He seems to have broken through the shrubbery and made for the road. Well, said the inspector, with a grave and thoughtful face, whoever he may have been, and whatever he may have wanted, he's gone for the present, and we have more immediate things to attend to. Now, Mr. Holmes, with your permission, I'll show you round the house. The various bedrooms and sitting-rooms had yielded nothing to a careful search. Apparently the tenants had brought little or nothing with them, and all the furniture down to the smallest details had been taken over with the house. A good deal of clothing with the stamp of Marks and Company, High Hoburn, had been left behind. Telegraphic inquiries had been already made, which showed that Marks knew nothing of his customer, save that he was a good payer. Odds and ends some pipes, a few novels, two of them in Spanish, an old-fashioned pinfire revolver, and a guitar were among the personal property. "'Nothing in all this,' said Baines, stalking, candle in hand, from room to room. "'But now, Mr. Holmes, I invite your attention to the kitchen.' It was a gloomy, high-ceilinged room at the back of the house, with a straw litter in one corner, which served apparently as a bed for the cook. The table was piled with half-eaten dishes and dirty plates, the debris of last night's dinner. "'Look at this,' said Baines. "'What do you make of it?' He held up his candle before an extraordinary object which stood at the back of the dresser. It was so wrinkled and shrunken and withered that it was difficult to say what it might have been. One could but say that it was black and leathery, and that it bore some resemblance to a dwarfish human figure. At first, as I examined it, I thought that it was a mummified negro baby, and then it seemed a very twisted and ancient monkey. Finally, I was left in doubt as to whether it was animal or human. A double band of white shells was strung round the centre of it. "'Very interesting, very interesting indeed,' said Holmes, peering at this sinister relic. "'Anything more?' In silence. Baines led the way to the sink, and held forward his candle. The limbs and body of some large white bird, torn savagely to pieces with the feathers still on, were littered all over it. Holmes pointed to the wattles on the severed head. "'A white cock,' said he. "'Most interesting. It really is a very curious case.' But Mr. Baines had kept his most sinister exhibit to the last. From under the sink he drew a zinc pail, which contained a quantity of blood. Then, from the table, he took a platter heaped with small pieces of charred bone. "'Something has been killed, and something has been burned. We raked all of these out of the fire. We had a doctor in this morning. He says they're not human.' Holmes smiled and rubbed his hands. "'I must congratulate you, Inspector, on handling so distinctive and instructive a case.' your powers if i may say so without offence seem superior to your opportunities inspector baines's small eyes twinkled with pleasure you're right mr holmes we stagnate in the provinces a case of this sort gives a man a chance and i hope that i shall take it what do you make of these bones a lamb i should say or a kid and the white cock curious mr baines very curious i should say almost unique yes sir there must have been some very strange people with some very strange ways in this house. One of them is dead. Did his companions follow and kill him? If they did, we should have them, for every port is watched. But my own views are different. Yes, sir, my own views are very different. You have a theory, then? <laughs> and I'll work it myself, Mr. Holmes. 
It's only due to my own credit to do so. Your name is made, but I still have to make mine. I should be glad to be able to say afterward that I solved it without your help. Holmes laughed good-humouredly. Well, well, Inspector, said he. Do you follow your path, and I will follow mine. My results are always very much at your service, if you should care to apply to me for them. I think that I have seen all that I wish in this house, and that my time may be more profitably employed elsewhere. Au revoir, and good luck. I could tell by numerous subtle signs, which might have been lost upon any one but myself, that Holmes was on a hot scent. As impassive as ever to the casual observer, there were, none the less, a subdued eagerness and suggestion of tension in his brightened eyes and brisker manner, which assured me that the game was afoot. After his habit he said nothing, and after mine I asked no questions sufficient for me to share the sport, and lend my humble help to the capture, without distracting that intent brain with needless interruption. All would come round to me in due time. I waited, therefore. But, to my ever-deepening disappointment, I waited in vain. Day succeeded day, and my friend took no step forward. One morning he spent in town, and I learned from a casual reference that he had visited the British Museum. Save for this one excursion, he spent his days in long and often solitary walks, or in chatting with a number of village gossips whose acquaintance he had cultivated. "'I'm sure, Watson, that a week in the country will be invaluable to you,' he remarked. "'It is very pleasant to see the first green shoots upon the hedges, and the catkins on the hazels once again.' with a spud a tin box and an elementary book on botany there are instructive days to be spent he prowled about with this equipment himself but it was a poor show of plants which he would bring back of an evening occasionally in our rambles we came across inspector baines his fat red face wreathed itself in smiles and his small eyes glittered as he greeted my companion he said little about the case but from that little we gathered that he also was not dissatisfied at the course of events. I must admit, however, that I was somewhat surprised when, some five days after the crime, I opened my morning paper to find in large letters, The Oxshot Mystery, A Solution, Arrest of Supposed Assassin. Holmes sprang in his chair as if he had been stung when I read him the headlines. "'By Jove!' he cried. "'You don't mean that Baines has got him?' "'Apparently,' said I, as I read the following report. "'Great excitement was caused in Esha and the neighbouring district "'when it was learned, late last night, "'that an arrest had been effected in connection with the Oxshot murder. "'It will be remembered that Mr. Garcia, of Wisteria Lodge, "'was found dead on Oxshot Common, his body showing signs of extreme violence, and that on the same night his servant and his cook fled, which appeared to show their participation in the crime. It was suggested, but never proved, that the deceased gentleman may have had valuables in the house, and that their abstraction was the motive of the crime. Every effort was made by Inspector Baines, who has the case in hand, to ascertain the hiding-place of the fugitives, and he had good reason to believe that they had not gone far, but were lurking in some retreat which had been already prepared. It was certain from the first, however, that they would eventually be detected, as the cook, from the evidence of one or two tradespeople who have caught a glimpse of him through the window, was a man of most remarkable appearance, being a huge and hideous mulatto, with yellowish features of a pronounced negroid type. This man has been seen since the crime, for he was detected and pursued by Constable Walters on the same evening, when he had the audacity to revisit Wisteria Lodge. Inspector Baines, considering that such a visit must have some purpose in view, and was likely, therefore, to be repeated, abandoned the house, but left an ambuscade in the shrubbery. The man walked into the trap and was captured last night, after a struggle in which Constable Downing was badly bitten by the savage. We understand that when the prisoner is brought before the magistrates, a remand will be applied for by the police, and that great developments are hoped from his capture. "'Really, we must see Baines at once,' cried Holmes, picking up his hat. "'We will just catch him before he starts.' 
we hurried down the village street and found as we had expected that the inspector was just leaving his lodgings you seen the paper mr holmes he asked holding one out to us yes baines i've seen it pray don't think it a liberty if i give you a word of friendly warning of warning mr holmes i have looked into this case with some care and i am not convinced that you are on the right line i don't want you to commit yourself too far unless you are sure oh, you're very kind mr holmes i assure you i speak for your good it seemed to me that something like a wink quivered for an instant over one of Mr. Baines's tiny eyes. We agreed to work on our own lines, Mr. Holmes. That's what I'm doing. Oh, very good, said Holmes. Don't blame me. No, sir, I believe you mean well by me, but we all have our own systems, Mr. Holmes. You have yours, and maybe I have mine. Let us say no more about it. You're welcome always to my niece. This fellow is a perfect savage, as strong as a cart horse and as fierce as the devil. He chewed Denning's thumb nearly off before they could master him. He hardly speaks a word of English, and we can't get nothing out of him but grunts. And you think you have evidence that he murdered his late master? I didn't say so, Mr. Holmes. I didn't say so. We all have our own little ways. You try yours, and I'll try mine. That's the agreement. Holmes shrugged his shoulders as we walked away together. I can't make the man out. He seems to be riding for a fall. Well, as he says, we must each try our own way and see what comes of it. But there's something in Inspector Baines which I can't quite understand. Just sit down in that chair, Watson, said Sherlock Holmes, when we had returned to our apartment at the Bull. I want to put you in touch with the situation, as I may need your help tonight. Let me show you the evolution of the case so far as I have been able to follow it simple as it has been in its leading features it has none the less presented surprising difficulties in the way of an arrest there are gaps in that direction which we have still to fill we will go back to the note which was handed in to garcia upon the evening of his death we may put aside this idea of baines's that garcia's servants were concerned in the matter the proof of this lies in the fact that it was he who had arranged for the presence of scott eccles which could only have been done for the purpose of an alibi it was garcia then who had an enterprise and apparently a criminal enterprise in hand that night in the course of which he met his death i say criminal because only a man with a criminal enterprise desires to establish an alibi who then is most likely to have taken his life surely the person against whom the criminal enterprise was directed so far it seems to me that we are on safe ground we can now see a reason for the disappearance of garcia's household they were all confederates in the same unknown crime if it came off when garcia returned any possible suspicion could be warded off by the englishman's evidence and all would be well but the attempt was a dangerous one and if garcia did not return by a certain hour it was probable that his own life had been sacrificed it had been arranged therefore that in such a case his two subordinates were to make for some prearranged spot where they could escape investigation and be in a position afterwards to renew their attempt that would fully explain the facts would it not the whole inexplicable tangle seemed to straighten out before me i wondered as i always did how it had not been obvious to me before but why should one servant return we can imagine that in the confusion of flight something precious something which he could not bear to part with had been left behind that would explain his persistence would it not well what is the next step the next step is the note received by garcia at the dinner it indicates a confederate at the other end now where was the other end i have already shown you that it could only lie in some large house and that the number of large houses is limited my first days in this village were devoted to a series of walks in which in the intervals of my botanical researches i made a reconnaissance of all the large houses and an examination of the family history of the occupants one house and only one riveted my attention it is the famous old jacobean grange of high gable one mile on the farther side of oxshot and less than half a mile from the scene of the tragedy the other mansions belong to prosaic and respectable people who live far aloof from romance but mr henderson of high gable was by all accounts a curious man to whom curious adventures might befall i concentrated my attention therefore upon him and his household a singular set of people watson the man himself the most singular of them all 
i managed to see him on a plausible pretext but i seemed to read in his dark deep-set brooding eyes that he was perfectly aware of my true business he is a man of fifty strong active with iron-grey hair great bunched black eyebrows the step of a deer and the air of an emperor a fierce masterful man with a red-hot spirit behind his parchment face he is either a foreigner or has lived long in the tropics for he is yellow and sapless but tough as whipcord his friend and secretary mr lucas is undoubtedly a foreigner chocolate brown wily suave and cat-like with a poisonous gentleness of speech you see watson we have come already upon two sets of foreigners one at wisteria lodge and one at high gable so our gaps are beginning to close these two men close and confidential friends are the centre of the household but there is one other person who for our immediate purpose may be even more important henderson has two children girls of eleven and thirteen their governess is a miss burnett an englishwoman of forty or thereabouts there is also one confidential man-servant this little group forms the real family for they travel about together and henderson is a great traveller always on the move it is only within the last few weeks that he has returned after a year's absence to high gable i may add that he is enormously rich and whatever his whims may be he can very easily satisfy them for the rest his house is full of butlers footmen maid-servants and the usual overfed underworked staff of a large english country-house so much i learned partly from village gossip and partly from my own observation there are no better instruments than discharged servants with a grievance and i was lucky enough to find one i call it luck but it would not have come my way had i not been looking out for it as baines remarks we all have our systems it was my system which enabled me to find john warner late gardener of high gable sacked in a moment of temper by his imperious employer he in turn had friends among the indoor servants who unite in their fear and dislike of their master so i had my key to the secrets of the establishment curious people watson i don't pretend to understand it all yet but are very curious people anyway it is a double-winged house and the servants live on one side the family on the other there's no link between the two save for henderson's own servant who serves the family meals everything is carried to a certain door which forms the one connection governess and children hardly go out at all except into the garden henderson never by any chance walks alone his dark secretary is like his shadow the gossip among the servants is that their master is terribly afraid of something sold his soul to the devil in exchange of money says warner and expects his creditor to come up and claim his own where they come from or who they are nobody has an idea they are very violent twice henderson has lashed at folk with his dog-whip and only his long purse and heavy compensation have kept him out of the courts well now watson let us judge the situation by this new information we may take it that the letter came out of this strange household and was an invitation to garcia to carry out some attempt which had already been planned who wrote the note it was some one within the citadel and it was a woman who then but miss burnett the governess all our reasoning seems to point that way at any rate we may take it as a hypothesis and see what consequences it would entail i may add that miss burnett's age and character make it certain that my first idea that there might be a love interest in our story is out of the question if she wrote the note she was presumably the friend and confederate of garcia what then might she be expected to do if she heard of his death if he met it in some nefarious enterprise her lips might be sealed still in her heart she must retain bitterness and hatred against those who had killed him and would presumably help so far as she could to have revenge upon them could we see her then and try to use her that was my first thought but now we come to a sinister fact miss burnett has not been seen by any human eye since the night of the murder from that evening she has utterly vanished is she alive has she perhaps met her end on the same night as the friend whom she had summoned or is she merely a prisoner there is the point which we still have to decide you will appreciate the difficulty of the situation watson there is nothing upon which we can apply for a warrant our whole scheme might seem fantastic if laid before a magistrate the woman's disappearance counts for nothing since in that extraordinary household any member of it might be invisible for a week and yet she may at the present moment be in danger of her life 
all i can do is watch the house and leave my agent warner on guard at the gates we can't let such a situation continue if the law can do nothing we must take the risk ourselves what do you suggest i know which is her room it is accessible from the top of an outhouse my suggestion is that you and i go to-night and see if we can strike at the very heart of the mystery it was not i must confess a very alluring prospect the old house with its atmosphere of murder the singular and formidable inhabitants the unknown dangers of the approach and the fact that we were putting ourselves legally in a false position all combined to damp my ardour but there was something in the ice-cold reasoning of holmes which made it impossible to shrink from any adventure which he might recommend one knew that thus and only thus could a solution be found i clasped his hand in silence and the die was cast but it was not destined that our investigation should have so adventurous an ending it was about five o'clock and the shadows of the march evening were beginning to fall when an excited rustic rushed into our room they've gone mr holmes they went by the last train the lady broke away and i've got her in a cab downstairs excellent warner cried holmes springing to his feet watson the gaps are closing rapidly in the cab was a woman half collapsed from nervous exhaustion she bore upon her aquiline and emaciated face the traces of some recent tragedy her head hung listlessly upon her breast but as she raised it and turned her dull eyes upon us i saw that her pupils were dark dots in the centre of the broad grey iris she was drugged with opium i watched at the gate same as you advised mr holmes said our emissary the discharged gardener when the carriage came out i followed it to the station she was like one walking in her sleep but when they tried to get her into a train she came to life and struggled they pushed her into the carriage she fought her way out again i took her part got her into a cab and here we are i shan't forget the face in that carriage window as i led her away i'd have a short life if he had his way the black-eyed scowling yellow devil we carried her upstairs laid her on the sofa and a couple of cups of the strongest coffee soon cleared her brain from the mists of the drug baines had been summoned by holmes and the situation rapidly explained to him why sir you've got me the very evidence i want said the inspector warmly shaking my friend by the hand i was on the same scent as you from the first what you were after henderson why mr holmes when you were crawling in the shrubbery at high gable i was up in one of the trees in the plantation and saw you down below it was just who could get the evidence first then why did you arrest the mulatto baines chuckled i was sure henderson as he calls himself felt that he was suspected and that he would lie low and make no move so long as he thought he was in danger i arrested the wrong man to make him believe our eyes were off him i knew he would be likely to clear off then and give us a chance at getting at miss burnett holmes laid his hand upon the inspector's shoulder you will rise high in your profession you have instinct and intuition said he baines flushed with pleasure i've had a plain clothes man waiting at the station all week wherever the high gable folk go he'll keep em in sight but he must have been hard put to it when miss burnett broke away however your man picked her up and all ends well we can't arrest her without evidence that is clear so the sooner that we get a statement the better every minute she gets stronger said holmes glancing at the governess but tell me baines who is this man henderson henderson the inspector answered is don murillo once called the tiger of san pedro the tiger of san pedro the whole history of the man came back to me in a flash he had made his name as the most lewd and bloodthirsty tyrant that had ever governed any country with a pretence to civilization strong fearless and energetic he had sufficient virtue to enable him to impose his odious vices upon a cowering people for ten or twelve years his name was a terror through all central america at the end of that time there was a universal rising against him but he was as cunning as he was cruel and at the first whisper of coming trouble he had secretly conveyed his treasures aboard a ship which was manned by devoted adherents it was an empty palace which was stormed by the insurgents next day 
the dictator, his two children, his secretary, and his wealth had all escaped them. From that moment he had vanished from the world, and his identity had been a frequent subject for comment in the European press. "'Yes, sir, Don Murillo, the Targaro San Pedro,' said Baines. "'If you look it up, you'll find the San Pedro colours are green and white, same as in the note, Mr. Holmes. Anderson, he called himself, but I tracked him back. Paris and Rome and Madrid to Barcelona, where his ship came in in 86. They've been looking for him all the time for their revenge, but it's only now that they've begun to find him out. They discovered him a year ago, said Miss Bennet, who had sat up and was now intently following the conversation. Once already his life has been attempted, but some evil spirit shielded him. Now again it is the noble chivalrous Garcia who has fallen, while the monster goes safe. But another will come, and yet another, until some day justice will be done. That is as certain as the rise of tomorrow's sun. Her thin hands clenched, and her worn face blanched with the passion of her hatred. "'But how come you into this matter, Miss Burnett?' asked Holmes. "'How can an English lady join in such a murderous affair?' "'I join in it because there is no other way in the world by which justice can be gained. What does the law of England care for the rivers of blood shed years ago in San Pedro, or for the shipload of treasure which this man has stolen? To you they are like crimes committed in some other planet.' But we know. We have learned the truth in sorrow and suffering. To us there is no fiend in hell like Juan Murillo, and no peace in life while his victims still cry for vengeance. No doubt, said Holmes. He was, as you say. I have heard that he was atrocious. But how are you affected? I will tell you it all. This villain's policy was to murder, on one pretext or another, every man who showed such promise that he might in time come to be a dangerous rival. My husband, yes, my real name is Signora Victor Durando, was a San Pedro minister in London. He met me and married me there. A nobler man never lived upon earth. Unhappily, Murillo heard of his excellence, recalled him on some pretext, and had him shot. With a premonition of his fate, he had refused to take me with him. His estates were confiscated, and I was left with a pittance and a broken heart. Then came the downfall of the tyrant. He escaped as you have just described, but the many whose lives he had ruined, whose nearest and dearest had suffered torture and death at his hands, would not let the matter rest. They banded themselves into a society which should never be dissolved until the work was done. It was my part, after we had discovered in the transformed Henderson the fallen despot, to attach myself to his household and keep the others in touch with his movements. This I was able to do by securing the position of governess in his family. He little knew that the woman who faced him at every meal was a woman whose husband he had hurried at an hour's notice into eternity. I smiled on him, did my duty to his children, and bided my time. An attempt was made in Paris and failed. We zigzagged swiftly here and there over Europe to throw off the pursuers, and finally returned to this house, which he had taken upon his first arrival in England. But here also the ministers of justice were waiting. Knowing that he would return there, Garcia, who is the son of the former highest dignitary in San Pedro, was waiting with two trusty companions of humble station, all three fired with the same reasons for revenge. He could do little during the day. Murillo took every precaution and never went out save with his satellite, Lucas, or Lopez as he was known in the days of his greatness. At night, however, he slept alone, and the avenger might find him. On a certain evening, which had been prearranged, I sent my friend final instructions, for the man was forever on the alert and continually changed his room. I was to see that the doors were open and the signal of a green or white light in a window which faced the drive was to give notice if all were safe or if the attempt had better be postponed. But everything went wrong with us. In some way I had excited the suspicion of Lopez, the secretary. He crept up behind me and sprang upon me just as I had finished the note. He and his master dragged me to my room and held judgment upon me as a convicted traitoress. Then and there they would have plunged their knives into me, could they have seen how to escape the consequences of the deed. Finally, after much debate, they concluded that my murder was too dangerous, but they determined to get rid forever of Garcia. They had gagged me, and Murillo twisted my arm round until I gave him the address. I swear that he might have twisted it off had I understood what it would mean to Garcia. 
Lopez addressed a note which I had written, sealed it with his sleeve link, and sent it by the hand of his servant, Jose. How they murdered him I do not know, save that it was Murillo's hand who struck him down, for Lopez had remained to guard me. I believe he must have waited among the gorse bushes through which the path winds and struck him down as he passed. At first they were of a mind to let him enter the house and kill him as a detected burglar. But they argued that if they were mixed up in an inquiry, their own identity would at once be publicly disclosed and they would be open to further attack. With the death of Garcia, the pursuit might cease, since such a death might frighten others from the task. All would now have been well for them, had it not been for my knowledge of what they had done. I have no doubt that there were times when my life hung in the balance. I was confined to my room, terrorized by the most horrible threats, cruelly ill-used to break my spirit, see the stab on my shoulder and the bruises from end to end of my arms, and a gag was thrust into my mouth on the one occasion when I tried to call from the window. For five days this cruel imprisonment continued, with hardly enough food to hold body and soul together. This afternoon a good lunch was brought me, but the moment after I took it I knew that I had been drugged. In a sort of dream I remember being half led, half carried to the carriage, in the same state I was conveyed to the train. Only then, when the wheels were almost moving, did I realize that my liberty lay in my own hands. I sprang out, they tried to drag me back, and had it not been for the help of this good man, who led me to the cab, I should never have broken away. Now, thank God, I am beyond their power for ever. We had all listened intently to this remarkable statement. It was Holmes who broke the silence. "'Our difficulties are not over,' he remarked, shaking his head. "'Our police work ends, but our legal work begins.' "'Exactly,' said I. "'A plausible lawyer could make it out as an act of self-defence. There may be a hundred crimes in the background, but it is only on this one that they can be tried.' "'Come, come,' said Baines cheerily. "'I think better of the law than that. Self-defence is one thing.' To entice a man in cold blood with the object of murdering him is another, whatever danger you may fear from him. No, no, we shall all be justified when we see the tenets of High Gable at the next Guildford Assizes. It is a matter of history, however, that a little time was still to elapse before the Tiger of San Pedro should meet with his deserts. Wily and bold, he and his companion threw their pursuer off their track by entering a lodging-house in Edmonton Street and leaving by the back gate into Curzon Square. From that day they were seen no more in England. Some six months afterwards the Marquis of Montalva and Signor Rulli, his secretary, were both murdered in their rooms at the Hotel Escurial at Madrid. The crime was ascribed to nihilism, and the murderers were never arrested. Inspector Baines visited us at Baker Street with a printed description of the dark face of the secretary and of the masterful features, the magnetic black eyes, and the tufted brows of his master, we could not doubt that justice, if belated, had come at last. "'A chaotic case, my dear Watson,' said Holmes, over an evening pipe. "'It will not be possible for you to present it in that compact form which is dear to your heart. It covers two continents, concerns two groups of mysterious persons, and is further complicated by the highly respectable presence of our friend Scott Eccles, whose inclusion shows me that the deceased Garcia had a scheming mind and a well-developed instinct of self-preservation. It is remarkable only for the fact that amid a perfect jungle of possibilities we, with our worthy collaborator the inspector, have kept our close hold on the essentials and so been guided along the crooked and winding path is there any point which is not quite clear to you the object of the mulatto cook's return i think that the strange creature in the kitchen may account for it the man was a primitive savage from the backwoods of san pedro and this was his fetish when his companion and he had fled to some prearranged retreat already occupied no doubt by a confederate the companion had persuaded him to leave so compromising an article of furniture but the mulatto's heart was with it and he was driven back to it the next day when on reconnoitring through the window he found policeman walters in possession he waited three days longer and then his piety or his superstition drove him to try once more inspector baines who with his usual astuteness had minimized the incident before me had really recognized its importance and had left a trap into which the creature walked any other point watson the torn bird the pail of blood, the charred bones. 
all the mystery of that weird kitchen holmes smiled as he turned up an entry in his notebook i spent a morning in the british museum reading up on that and other points here is a quotation from Eckerman's Voodooism and the Negroid Religions. The true voodoo worshipper attempts nothing of importance without certain sacrifices, which are intended to propitiate his unclean gods. In extreme cases these rites take the form of human sacrifices, followed by cannibalism. The more usual victims are a white cock, which is plucked in pieces alive, or a black goat, whose throat is cut and body burned so you see our savage friend was very orthodox in his ritual it is grotesque watson holmes added as he slowly fastened his notebook but as i have had occasion to remark there is but one step from the grotesque to the horrible end of section two Section three of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Slipperfox recording is in the public domain. Section three The Adventure of the Cardboard Box Doctor Watson read by Corey Samuel Sherlock Holmes read by Beth Thomas Inspector Lestrade read by Natalie Paula Miss Susan Cushing read by Shakira Searle Doctor to Miss Cushing by Norman Elfer. Miss Sarah Cushing, read by Francis Brown. Mary Browner, read by Kay Cotter. Cabby, read by Brian Mansey. Jem Browner, read by James Callahan. In choosing a few typical cases which illustrate the remarkable mental qualities of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I have endeavoured, as far as possible, to select those which presented the minimum of sensationalism, while offering a fair field for his talents. It is, however, unfortunately impossible entirely to separate the sensational from the criminal, and a chronicler is left in the dilemma that he must either sacrifice details which are essential to his statement, and so give a false impression of the problem, or he must use matter which chance, and not choice, has provided him with. With this short preface I shall turn to my notes of what proved to be a strange, though a peculiarly terrible, chain of events. It was a blazing hot day in August. Baker Street was like an oven, and the glare of the sunlight upon the yellow brickwork of the house across the road was painful to the eye. It was hard to believe that these were the same walls which loomed so gloomily through the fogs of winter. Our blinds were half drawn, and Holmes lay curled upon the sofa, reading and re-reading a letter which he had received by the morning post. For myself, my term of service in India, had trained me to stand heat better than cold, and a thermometer at ninety was no hardship. But the morning paper was uninteresting, Parliament had risen, everybody was out of town, and I yearned for the glades of the New Forest, or the shingle of South Sea. A depleted bank account had caused me to postpone my holiday, and as to my companion, neither the country nor the sea presented the slightest attraction to him. He loved to lie in the very centre of five millions of people, with his filaments stretching out and running through them, responsive to every little rumour or suspicion of unsolved crime. Appreciation of nature found no place among his many gifts, and his only change was when he turned his mind from the evildoer of the town to track down his brother of the country. Finding that Holmes was too absorbed for conversation, I had tossed aside the barren paper and leaning back in my chair I fell into a brown study. Suddenly my companion's voice broke in upon my thoughts. "'You are right, Watson,' said he. "'It does seem a most preposterous way of settling a dispute.' "'Most preposterous!' I exclaimed, and then suddenly realising how he had echoed the inmost thought of my soul, I sat up in my chair and stared at him in blank amazement. "'What is this, Holmes?' I cried. This is beyond anything which I could have imagined. He laughed heartily at my perplexity. You remember, said he, that some little time ago when I read you the passage of one of Poe's sketches in which a close reasoner follows the unspoken thoughts of his companion, you were inclined to treat the matter as a mere tour de force of the author. On my remarking that I was constantly in the habit of doing the same thing, you expressed incredulity. Oh, no! 
perhaps not with your tongue my dear watson but certainly with your eyebrows so when i saw you throw down your paper and enter upon a train of thought i was very happy to have the opportunity of reading it off and eventually of breaking into it as proof that i had been in rapport with you but i was still far from satisfied in the example which you read to me said i the reasoner drew his conclusions from the actions of the man whom he observed if i remember right he stumbled over a heap of stones looked up at the stars and so on but i have been seated quietly in my chair and what clues can i have given you you do yourself an injustice the features are given to man as the means by which he shall express his emotions and yours are faithful servants do you mean to say that you read my train of thoughts from my features your features and especially your eyes perhaps you cannot yourself recall how your reverie commenced no i cannot then i will tell you after throwing down your paper which was the action which drew my attention to you you sat for half a minute with a vacant expression then your eyes fixed themselves upon your newly framed picture of general gordon and i saw by the alteration of your face that a train of thought had been started but it did not lead very far your eyes flashed across to the unframed portrait of henry ward beecher which stands upon the top of your books then you glanced up at the wall and of course your meaning was obvious you were thinking that if the portrait were framed it would just cover that bare space and correspond with gordon's picture there you have followed me wonderfully i exclaimed so far i could hardly have gone astray but now your thoughts went back to beecher and you looked hard across as if you were studying the character in his features then your eyes ceased to pucker but you continued to look across and your face was thoughtful you were recalling the incidents of beecher's career i was well aware that you could not do this without thinking of the mission which he undertook on behalf of the north at the time of the civil war for i remember your expressing your passionate indignation at the way in which he was received by the more turbulent of our people you felt so strongly about it that i knew you could not think of beecher without thinking of that also when a moment later i saw your eyes wander away from the picture i suspected that your mind had now turned to the civil war and when i observed that your lips set your eyes sparkled and your hands clenched i was positive that you were indeed thinking of the gallantry which was shown by both sides of that desperate struggle but then again your face grew sadder you shook your head you were dwelling upon the sadness and horror and useless wasted life your hand stole towards your own wound and a smile quivered on your lips which showed me that the ridiculous side of this method of settling international questions had forced itself upon your mind at this point i agreed with you that it was preposterous and was glad to find that all my deductions had been correct absolutely said i and now that you have explained it i confess that i am as amazed as before it was very superficial my dear watson i assure you i should not have intruded upon your attention had you not shown some incredulity the other day but i have in my hands here a little problem which may prove to be more difficult of solution than my small essay in thought-reading have you observed in the paper a short paragraph referring to the remarkable contents of a packet sent through the post to miss cushing of cross street croydon no i saw nothing ah then you must have overlooked it just toss it over to me here it is under the financial column perhaps you would be good enough to read it aloud i picked up the paper which he had thrown back to me and read the paragraph indicated it was headed a gruesome packet miss susan cushing living at cross street croydon has been made the victim of what must be regarded as a peculiarly revolting practical joke unless some more sinister meaning should prove to be attached to the incident at two o'clock yesterday afternoon a small packet wrapped in brown paper was handed in by the postman a cardboard box was inside which was filled with coarse salt on emptying this miss cushing was horrified to find two human ears apparently quite freshly severed the box had been sent by parcel post from belfast upon the morning before there is no indication as to the sender and the matter is the more mysterious as miss cushing who is a maiden lady of fifty has led a most retired life and has so few acquaintances or correspondents that it is a rare event for her to receive anything through the post some years ago however when she resided at penge she let apartments in her house to three young medical students whom she was obliged to get rid of on account of their noisy and irregular habits the police are of opinion that this outrage may have been perpetrated upon miss cushing by these youths who owed her a grudge and who hoped to frighten her by sending her these relics of the dissecting rooms some probability is lent to the theory by the fact that one of these students came from the north of ireland and to the very best of miss cushing's belief from belfast in the meantime the matter is being actively investigated 
Mr. Lestrade, one of the very smartest of our detective officers, being in charge of the case. "'So much for the Daily Chronicle,' said Holmes, as I finished reading. "'Now for our friend Lestrade. I had a note from him this morning in which he says, "'I think that this case is very much in your line. We have every hope of clearing the matter up, but we find a little difficulty in getting anything to work upon. We have, of course, wired to the Belfast Post Office, but a large number of parcels were handed in upon that day, and they have no means of identifying this particular one, or of remembering the sender. The box is a half pound of honeydew tobacco, and it does not help us in any way. The medical student theory still appears to me to be the most feasible. But if you should have a few hours to spare, I should be very happy to see you out here. I shall be either at the house or at the police station all day. What say you, Watson? Can you rise superior to the heat and run down to Croydon with me on the off chance of a case for your annals? I was longing for something to do. You shall have it, then. Ring for our boots and tell them to order a cab. I'll be back in a moment when I have changed my dressing gown and filled my cigar case. A shower of rain fell while we were in the train, and the heat was far less oppressive in Croydon than in town. Holmes had sent on a wire, so that Lestrade, as wiry, as dapper, and as ferret-like as ever, was waiting for us at the station. A walk of five minutes took us to Cross Street, where Miss Cushing resided. It was a very long street of two-storey brick houses, neat and prim, with whitened stone steps and little groups of aproned women gossiping at the doors. Halfway down Lestrade stopped and tapped at a door, which was opened by a small servant girl. Miss Cushing was sitting in the front room, into which we were ushered. She was a placid-faced woman, with large, gentle eyes, and grizzled hair curving down over her temples on each side. A worked antimacassar lay upon her lap, and a basket of coloured silks stood upon a stool beside her. "'They are in the outhouse, those dreadful things,' said she, as Lestrade entered. "'I wish that you would take them away altogether.' "'So I shall, Miss Cushing. I only kept them here until my friend, Mr. Holmes, should have seen them in your presence.' "'Why in my presence, sir?' "'In case he wished to ask any questions.' "'What is the use of asking me questions, when I tell you I know nothing whatever about it?' "'Quite so, madam,' said Holmes, in his soothing way. "'I have no doubt that you have been annoyed more than enough already over this business.' "'Indeed I have, sir.' I am a quiet woman, and live a retired life. It is something new for me to see my name in the papers, and to find the police in my house. I won't have those things in here, Mr. Lestrade. If you wish to see them, you must go to the outhouse." It was a small shed in the narrow garden which ran behind the house. Lestrade went in and brought out a yellow cardboard box, with a piece of brown paper and some string. There was a bench at the end of the path, and we all sat down, while Holmes examined, one by one, the articles which Lestrade had handed to him. "'The string is exceedingly interesting,' he remarked, holding it up to the light and sniffing at it. "'What do you make of this string, Lestrade?' "'It has been tarred.' "'Precisely. It is a piece of tarred twine. You have also, no doubt, remarked that Miss Cushing has cut the cord with scissors, as can be seen by the double fray on each side. This is of importance.' "'I cannot see the importance,' said Lestrade. "'The importance lies in the fact that the knot is left intact, and that this knot is of a peculiar character.' "'It is very neatly tied. I had already made a note of that effect,' said Lestrade complacently. "'So much for the string, then,' said Holmes, smiling. "'Now for the box wrapper. Brown paper with a distinct smell of coffee. What, did you not observe it? I think there can be no doubt of it.' address printed in rather straggling characters miss s cushing cross street croydon done with a broad pointed pen probably a j and with very inferior ink the word croydon has originally been spelled with an i which has been changed to a y the parcel was directed then by a man the printing is distinctly masculine of limited education and unacquainted with the town of croydon so far so good the box is a yellow half-pound honeydew box with nothing distinctive save two thumb marks at the left bottom corner it is filled with rough salt of the quality used for preserving hides and other of the coarser commercial purposes and embedded in it are these very singular enclosures he took out the two ears as he spoke and laying a board across his knee he examined them minutely while lestrade and i bending forward on each side of him 
glanced alternately at these dreadful relics and at the thoughtful, eager face of our companion. Finally he returned them to the box once more, and sat for a while in deep meditation. "'You have observed, of course,' said he at last, "'that the ears are not a pair?' "'Yes, I have noticed that, but if this were the practical joke of some students from the dissecting rooms, it would be as easy for them to send two odd ears as a pair.' precisely but this is not a practical joke are you sure of it the presumption is strongly against it bodies in the dissecting rooms are injected with preservative fluid these ears bear no signs of this they are fresh too they have been cut off with a blunt instrument which would hardly happen if a student had done it again carbolic or rectified spirits would be the preservatives which would suggest themselves to the medical mind certainly not rough salt i repeat that there is no practical joke here but we are investigating a serious crime a vague thrill ran through me as I listened to my companion's words, and saw the stern gravity which had hardened his features. This brutal preliminary seemed to shadow forth some strange and inexplicable horror in the background. Lestrade, however, shook his head like a man who was only half convinced. "'There are objections to the joke theory, no doubt,' said he. "'But there are much stronger reasons against the other. We know that this woman had led a most quiet and respectable life at Pank and here for the last twenty years. She has hardly been away from her home for a day during that time. Why on earth, then, should any criminal send her proofs of his guilt, especially as, unless she is a most consummate actress, she understands quite as little of the matter as we do? That is the problem which we have to solve, Holmes answered. And for my part, I shall set about it by presuming that my reasoning is correct, and that a double murder has been committed. One of these ears is a woman's, small, finely formed, and pierced for an earring the other is a man's sunburned discoloured and also pierced for an earring these two people are presumably dead or we should have heard their story before now to-day is friday the packet was posted on thursday morning the tragedy then occurred on wednesday or tuesday or earlier if the two people were murdered who but their murderer would have sent this sign of his work to miss cushing we may take it that the sender of the packet is the man whom we want but he must have some strong reason for sending miss cushing this packet what reason then it must have been to tell her that the deed was done or to pain her perhaps but in that case she knows who it is does she know i doubt it if she knew why would she call the police in she might have buried the ears and no one would have been the wiser that is what she would have done if she had wished to shield the criminal but if she does not wish to shield him she would give his name there is a tangle here which needs straightening out he had been talking in a high quick voice staring blankly up over the garden fence but now he sprang briskly to his feet and walked towards the house. "'I have a few questions to ask Miss Cushing,' said he. "'In that case I may leave you here,' said Lestrade. "'For I have other small business on hand. I think that I have nothing further to learn from Miss Cushing. You will find me at the police station.' "'We shall look in on our way to the train,' answered Holmes. A moment later he and I were back in the front room, where the impassive lady was still quietly working away at her antimacassar. She put it down on her lap as we entered, and looked at us with her frank, searching blue eyes. "'I am convinced, sir,' she said, "'that this matter is a mistake, and that the parcel was never meant for me at all. I have said this several times to the gentleman from Scotland Yard, but he simply laughs at me. I have not an enemy in the world, as far as I know, so why should any one play me such a trick?' "'I am coming to be of the same opinion, Miss Cushing,' said Holmes, taking a seat beside her. "'I think that it is more than probable—' He paused, and I was surprised, on glancing round, to see that he was staring with singular intentness at the lady's profile. Surprise and satisfaction were both for an instant to be read upon his eager face, though when she glanced round to find out the cause of his silence, he had become as demure as ever. I stared hard myself at her flat, grizzled hair, her trim cap, her little gilt earrings, her placid features, but I could see nothing which could account for my companion's evident excitement. There were one or two questions. "'Oh, I am weary of questions!' cried Miss Cushing impatiently. "'You have two sisters, I believe.' "'How could you know that?' I observed, the very instant that I entered the room, that you have a portrait group of three ladies upon the mantelpiece, one of whom is undoubtedly yourself, while the others are so exceedingly like you that there could be no doubt of the relationship. Yes, you are quite right. Those are my sisters, Sarah and Mary. 
and here at my elbow is another portrait taken at liverpool of your younger sister in the company of a man who appears to be a steward by his uniform i observe that she was unmarried at the time you are very quick at observing that is my trade well you are quite right but she was married to mr browner a few days afterwards he was on the south american line when that was taken but he was so fond of her that he couldn't abide to leave her for so long and he got into the liverpool and london boats ah the conqueror perhaps no the mayday when last i heard jim came down here to see me once that was before he broke the pledge but afterwards he would always take drink when he was ashore and a little drink would send him stark staring mad ah it was a bad day that ever he took a glass in his hand again first he dropped me then he quarrelled with sarah and now that mary has stopped writing we don't know how things are going with them it was evident that miss cushing had come upon a subject on which she felt very deeply like most people who lead a lonely life she was shy at first but ended by becoming extremely communicative she told us many details about her brother-in-law the steward and then wandering off on the subject of her former lodgers the medical students she gave us a long account of their delinquencies with their names and those of their hospitals holmes listened attentively to everything throwing in a question from time to time about your second sister sarah said he i wonder since you are both maiden ladies that you do not keep house together ah you don't know sarah's temper or you would wonder no more i tried it when i came to croydon and we kept on until about two months ago when we had to part i don't want to say a word against my own sister but she was always meddlesome and hard to please was sarah you say that she quarrelled with your liverpool relations yes and they were the best of friends at one time why she went up there to live in order to be near them and now she has no word hard enough for jim browner the last six months that she was here she would speak of nothing but his drinking and his ways he had caught her meddling i suspect and given her a bit of his mind and that was the start of it thank you miss cushing said holmes rising and bowing your sister sarah lives i think you said at new street wallington good-bye and i am very sorry that you should have been troubled over a case with which as you say you have nothing whatever to do there was a cab passing as we came out and holmes hailed it how far to wallington he asked only about a mile sir very good jump in watson we must strike while the iron is hot simple as the case is there have been one or two very instructive details in connection with it just pull up at a telegraph office as you pass cabby holmes sent off a short wire and for the rest of the drive lay back in the cab with his hat tilted over his nose to keep the sun from his face our drive pulled up at a house which was not unlike the one which we had just quitted my companion ordered him to wait and had his hand upon the knocker when the door opened and a grave young gentleman in black with a very shiny hat appeared on the step is miss cushing at home asked holmes miss sarah cushing is extremely ill said he she has been suffering since yesterday from brain symptoms of great severity as her medical adviser i cannot possibly take the responsibility of allowing anyone to see her i should recommend you call again in ten days he drew on his gloves closed the door and marched off down the street well if we can't we can't said holmes cheerfully perhaps she could not or would not have told you much i did not wish her to tell me anything I only wanted to look at her. However, I think that I have got all that I want. Drive us to some decent hotel, cabby, where we may have some lunch, and afterwards we shall drop down upon Friend Lestrade at the police station. We had a pleasant little meal together, during which Holmes would talk about nothing but violins, narrating with great exultation how he had purchased his own Stradivarius, which was worth at least five hundred guineas, at a Jew broker's in Tottenham Court Road for fifty-five shillings. This led him to Paganini and we sat for an hour over a bottle of claret while he told me anecdote after anecdote of that extraordinary man the afternoon was far advanced and the hot glare had softened into a mellow glow before we found ourselves at the police station lestrade was waiting for us at the door a telegram for you mr holmes said he ah it is the answer he tore it open 
glanced his eyes over it, and crumpled it into his pocket. "'That's all right,' said he. "'Have you found out anything?' "'I have found out everything.' "'What?' Lestrade stared at him in amazement. "'You are joking.' "'I was never more serious in my life. A shocking crime has been committed, and I think I have now laid bare every detail of it.' "'And the criminal?' Holmes scribbled a few words upon the back of one of his visiting cards and threw it over to Lestrade. "'That is the name,' he said. "'You cannot effect an arrest until tomorrow night at the earliest. I should prefer that you do not mention my name at all in connection with the case, as I choose to be only associated with those crimes which present some difficulty in their solution. Come on, Watson.' We strode off together to the station, leaving Lestrade still staring with a delighted face at the card which Holmes had thrown him. "'The case?' said Sherlock Holmes, as we chatted over our cigars that night in our rooms at Baker Street. "'It's one where, as in the investigations which you have chronicled under the names of A Study in Scarlet and The Sign of the Four, we have been compelled to reason backward from effects to causes. I have written to Lestrade asking him to supply us with the details which are now wanting, and which he will only get after he has secured his man. That he may be safely trusted to do, for although he is absolutely devoid of reason, he is as tenacious as a bulldog when once he understands what he has to do.' And, indeed, it is just this tenacity which has brought him to the top at Scotland Yard. "'Your case is not complete, then?' I asked. "'It is fairly complete in essentials. We know who the author of the revolting business is, although one of the victims still escapes us. Of course you have formed your own conclusions.' "'I presume that this Jim Browner, the steward of a Liverpool boat, is the man whom you suspect?' "'Oh, it is more than a suspicion.' "'And yet I cannot see anything save very vague indications.' "'On the contrary. To my mind, nothing could be more clear. Let me run over the principal steps. We approached the case, you remember, with an absolutely blank mind, which is always an advantage. We had formed no theories. We were simply there to observe and to draw inferences from our observations. What did we see first? A very placid and respectable lady, who seemed quite innocent of any secret, and a portrait which showed me that she had two younger sisters. It instantly flashed across my mind that the box might have been meant for one of these. I set the idea aside as one which could be disproved or confirmed at our leisure. Then we went to the garden, as you remember, and we saw the very singular contents of the little yellow box. The string was of a quality which is used by sailmakers aboard ship, and at once a whiff of the sea was perceptible in our investigation. When I observed that the knot was one which is popular with sailors, that the parcel had been posted at a port, and that the male ear was pierced for an earring which is so much more common among sailors than landsmen, I was quite certain that all the actors in the tragedy were to be found among our seafaring classes. When I came to examine the address of the packet, I observed that it was to Miss S. Cushing. Now, the oldest sister would, of course, be Miss Cushing, and although her initial was S., it might belong to one of the others as well. In that case, we should have to commence our investigation from a fresh basis altogether. I therefore went into the house with the intention of clearing up this point. I was about to assure Miss Cushing that I was convinced that a mistake had been made, when you may remember that I suddenly came to a stop. The fact was that I had just seen something which filled me with surprise, and at the same time narrowed the field of our inquiry immensely. As a medical man, you are aware, Watson, that there is no part of the body which varies so much as the human ear. Each ear is, as a rule, quite distinctive and differs from all other ones. In last year's anthropological journal you will find two short monographs from my pen upon the subject. I had, therefore, examined the ears in the box with the eyes of an expert, and had carefully noted their anatomical peculiarities. Imagine my surprise, then, when on looking at Miss Cushing, I perceived that her ear corresponded exactly with the female ear which I had just inspected. The matter was entirely beyond coincidence. There was the same shortening of the pinner, the same broad curve of the upper lobe, the same convolution of the inner cartilage. In all essentials it was the same ear. In the first place, her sister's name was Sarah, and her address had until recently been the same, so that it was quite obvious how the mistake had occurred, and for whom the packet was meant. Then we heard of this steward, married to the third sister, and learned that he had at one time been so intimate with Miss Sarah that she had actually gone up to Liverpool to be near the Browners, but a quarrel had afterwards divided them. This quarrel had put a stop to all communications for some months, so that if Browner had occasion to address a packet to Miss Sarah, he would undoubtedly have done so to her old address. And now the matter had begun to straighten itself out wonderfully. We had learned of the existence of this steward, an impulsive man of strong passions, you remember that he threw up what must have been a very superior berth in order to be nearer to his wife, subject, too, to occasional fits of hard drinking. We had reason to believe that his wife had been murdered, and that a man, presumably a seafaring man, had been murdered at the same time. Jealousy, of course, at once suggests itself as the motive for the crime. And why should these proofs of the deed be sent to Miss Sarah Cushing? 
probably because during her residence in liverpool she had some hand in bringing about the events which led to the tragedy you will observe that this line of boats call at belfast dublin and waterford so that presuming that browner had committed the deed and had embarked at once upon his steamer the may day belfast would be the first place at which he could post his terrible packet a second solution was at this stage obviously possible and although i thought it exceedingly unlikely i was determined to elucidate it before going further an unsuccessful lover might have killed mr and mrs browner and the male ear might have belonged to the husband there were many grave objections to this theory but it was conceivable i therefore sent off a telegram to my friend algar of the liverpool force and asked him to find out if mrs browner were at home and if browner had departed in the mayday we then went on to wallington to visit miss sarah i was curious in the first place to see how far the family ear had been reproduced in her then of course she might give us very important information but i was not sanguine that she would she must have heard of the business the day before since all croydon was ringing with it and she alone could have understood for whom the packet was meant if she had been willing to help justice she would probably have communicated with the police already however it was clearly our duty to see her and so we went we found that the news of the arrival of the packet for her illness dated from that time had such an effect upon her as to bring on brain fever it was clearer than ever that she understood its full significance but equally clear that we should have to wait some time for any assistance from her however we were really independent of her help our answers were waiting for us at the police station where i had directed algar to send them nothing could be more conclusive mrs browner's house had been closed for more than three days and the neighbours were of the opinion that she had gone south to see her relatives it had been ascertained at the shipping offices that browner had left aboard of the mayday and i calculate that she is due in the thames to-morrow night when he arrives he will be met by the obtuse but resolute lestrade and i have no doubt that we shall have all of our details filled in sherlock holmes was not disappointed in his expectations two days later he received a bulky envelope which contained a short note from the detective and a typewritten document which covered several pages of foolscap lestrade has got him all right said holmes glancing up at me perhaps it would interest you to hear what he says my dear mr holmes in accordance with the scheme which we had formed in order to test our theories the we is rather fine watson is it not i went down to albert dock yesterday at six p m and boarded the s s may day belonging to liverpool dublin and london steam packet company on inquiry i found that there was a steward on board of the name james browner and he had acted during the voyage in such an extraordinary manner that the captain had been compelled to relieve him of his duties on descending to his berth i found him seated upon a chest with his head sunk upon his hands rocking himself to and fro he is a big powerful chap clean-shaven and very swarthy something like aldridge who helped us in the bogus laundry affair he jumped up when he heard my business and i had my whistle to my lips to call a couple of river police who were round the corner but he seemed to have no heart in him and he held out his hands quietly enough for the darbies we brought him along to the cells and his box as well for we thought there might be something incriminating but bar a big sharp knife such as most sailors have we got nothing for our trouble however we find that we shall want no more evidence for on being brought before the inspector at the station he asked leave to make a statement which was of course taken down just as he made it by our shorthand man we had three copies typewritten one of which i enclose the affair proves as i always thought it would to be an extremely simple one but i am obliged to you for assisting me in my investigation with kind regards yours truly g lestrade hmm. the investigation was really a very simple one remarked holmes but i don't think it struck him in that light when he first called us in however let us see what jim browner has to say for himself this is his statement as made before the inspector montgomery at the shadwell police station and it has the advantage of being verbatim have i anything to say yes i have a deal to say i have to make a clean breast of it all you can hang me or you can leave me alone i don't care a plug what you do i tell you i've not shut an eye in sleep since i did it and i don't believe i ever will again until i get past all waking sometimes it's his face but most generally it's hers i'm never without one or the other before me he looks frowning and black-like but she has a kind of surprise upon her face ay the white lamb she might well be surprised when she read death on a face that had seldom looked anything but love upon her before but it was sarah's fault and may the curse of a broken man put a blight upon her and set the blood rotting in her veins it's not that i want to clear myself I know that I went back to drink, like the beast that I was, but she would have forgiven me. She would have stuck as close to me as a rope to a block if that woman had never darkened our door. 
Her Sarah Cushing loved me. That's the root of the business. She loved me until all her love turned to poisonous hate when she knew that I thought more of my wife's footmark in the mud than I did of her whole body and soul. There were three sisters altogether. The old one was just a good woman, the second was a devil, and the third was an angel. Sarah was thirty-three, and Mary was twenty-nine when I married. We were just as happy as the day was long when we set up house together, and in all Liverpool there was no better woman than my Mary. And then we asked Sarah up for a week, and the week grew into a month, and one thing led to another until she was just one of ourselves. I was blue ribbon at that time, and we were putting a little money by, and all was as bright as a new dollar. My God, whoever would have thought that it could have come to this? Whoever would have dreamed it? I used to be home for the weekends very often, and sometimes if the ship were held back for cargo, I would have a whole week at a time, and in this way I saw a deal with my sister-in-law, Sarah. She was a fine, tall woman, black and quick and fierce, with a proud way of carrying her head and a glint from her eye like a spark from a flint. But when little Mary was there, I had never a thought of her, and that I swear, as I hope for God's mercy. It had seemed to me sometimes that she liked to be alone with me, or to coax me out for a walk with her, but I had never thought anything of that. But one evening my eyes were opened. I had come up from the ship and found my wife out, but Sarah at home. Where's Mary? I asked. Oh, she's gone to pay some accounts. I was impatient and paced up and down the room. Can't you be happy for five minutes without Mary, Jim? Says she. It's a bad compliment to me that you can't be contented with my society for so short a time. That's all right, my lass, said I, putting out my hand towards her in a kindly way. But she had it in both hers in an instant, and they burned as if they were in a fever. I looked into her eyes and I read it all there. There was no need for her to speak, nor for me either. I frowned and drew my hand away. Then she stood by my side in silence for a bit, and then put up her hand and patted me on the shoulder. Steady, old Jim, <laughs> said she, and with a kind of mocking laugh she ran out of the room. Well, from that time Sarah hated me with her whole heart and soul, and she's a woman who can hate too. I was a fool to let her go on biding with us, a besotted fool, but I never said a word to Mary, for I knew it would grieve her. Things went on much as before, but after a time I began to find that there was a bit of change in Mary herself. She had always been so trusting and so innocent. But now she became queer and suspicious, wanting to know where I had been and what I had been doing, and whom my letters were from, and what I had in my pockets, and a thousand such follies. Day by day she grew queerer and more irritable, and we had ceaseless rows about nothing. I was fairly puzzled by it all. Sarah avoided me now, but she and Mary were just inseparable. I can see now how she was plotting and scheming and poisoning my wife's mind against me, but I was such a blind beetle that I could not understand it at the time. Then I broke my blue ribbon and began to drink again, but I think I should not have done it if Mary had been the same as ever. She had some reason to be disgusted with me now, and the gap between us began to be wider and wider. And then this Alec Fairbairn chipped in, and things became a thousand times blacker. It was to see Sarah that he came to my house first, but soon it was to see us, for he was a man with winning ways, and he made friends wherever he went. He was a dashing, swaggering chap, smart and curled who had seen half the world and could talk of what he had seen. He was good company, I won't deny it, and he had wonderful polite ways with him for a sailor man, so that I think there must have been a time when he knew more of the poop than of the forecastle. For a month he was in and out of my house, and never once did it cross my mind that harm might come of his soft, tricky ways. And then at last something made me suspect, and from that day my peace was gone forever. It was only a little thing, too. I'd come into the parlour unexpected, and as I was walking in the door, I saw a light of welcome on my wife's face, but as she saw who it was, it faded again, and she turned away with a look of disappointment. That was enough for me. There was no one but Alec Fairbairn whose steps she could have mistaken for mine. If I could have seen him then, I should have killed him, for I have always been like a madman when my temper gets loose. Mary saw the devil's light in my eyes, and she ran forward with her hands on my sleeve. Don't, Jim, don't, says she. Where's Sarah? I asked. In the kitchen says she. Sarah, says I as I went in, this man Fairbairn is never to darken my door again. Why not? says she. Because I order it. Oh, says she. If my friends are not good enough for this house, then I'm not good enough for it either. 
You can do what you like, says I, but if Fairbairn shows his face here again, I'll send you one of his ears for a keepsake. She was frightened by my face, I think, for she never answered a word, and the same evening she left my house. Well, I don't know now whether it was pure devilry on the part of this woman, or whether she thought she could turn me against my wife by encouraging her to misbehave. Anyway, she took a house just two streets off and let lodgings to sailors. Fairbairn used to stay there, and Mary would go round to have tea with her sister and him. How often she went, I don't know, but I followed her one day, and as I broke in the door, Fairbairn got away over the back garden wall like the cowardly skunk that he was. I swore to my wife that I would kill her if I found her in his company again, and I lay there back with me, sobbing and trembling, and as white as a piece of paper. There was no trace of love between us any longer. I could see that she hated me and feared me, and when the thought of it drove me to drink, then she despised me as well. Well, Sarah found that she could not make a living in Liverpool, so she went back, as I understand, to live with her sister in Croydon, and things jogged on much the same as ever at home. And then came this week, and all the misery and ruin. It was in this way. We had gone in the May Day for a round voyage of seven days, but a hogshead got loose and started one of our plates, so that we had to put back into port for twelve hours. I left the ship and came home, thinking what a surprise it would be for my wife and hoping that maybe she would be glad to see me so soon. The thought was in my head as I turned into my own street, and at that moment a cab passed me and there she was, sitting by the side of Fairbairn, the two chatting and laughing, with never a thought for me as I stood watching them from the footpath. I tell you, and I give you my word for it, that from that moment I was not my own master, and it is all like a dim dream when I look back on it. I had been drinking hard of late, and the two things together fairly turned my brain. There's something throbbing in my head now, like a docker's hammer. But that morning I seemed to have all Niagara whizzing and buzzing in my ears. Well, I took to my heels, and I ran after the cab. I had a heavy oak stick in my hand, and I tell you, I saw red from the first. But as I ran, I got cunning too, and I hung back a little just to see them without being seen. They pulled up soon at the railway station. There was a good crowd around the booking office, so I got quite close to them without being seen. They took tickets for New Brighton. So did I, but I got in three carriages behind them. When we reached it, they walked along the parade, and I was never more than a hundred yards from them. At last, I saw them hire a boat and start for a row, for it was a very hot day and they thought, no doubt, that it would be cooler in the water. It was just as if they had been given into my hands. There was a bit of a haze and you could not see more than a few hundred yards. I hired a boat for myself and I pulled after them. I could see the blur of the craft, but they were going nearly as fast as I and they must have been a long mile from the shore before I caught them up. The haze was like a curtain all around us and there were we three in the middle of it. My God! Shall I ever forget their faces when they saw who it was in the boat that was closing in upon them? She screamed out. He swore like a madman, jabbed at me with an oar, for he must have seen death in my eyes. I got past it and got in one of my stick that crushed his head like an egg. I would have spared her, perhaps, for all my madness, but she threw her arms round him, crying out to him and calling him, Alec! I struck again and she lay stretched beside him. I was like a wild beast then that had tasted blood. If Sarah had been there, by the Lord, she should have joined them. I pulled out my knife and, well, there, I've said enough. It gave me a kind of savage joy when I thought how Sarah would feel when she had such signs as these of what her meddling had brought about. Then I tied the bodies into the boat, stove a plank, and stood by until they had sunk. I knew very well that the owner would think that they had lost their bearings in the haze and had drifted out to sea. I cleaned myself up got back to land and joined my ship without a soul having suspicion of what had passed. That night I made up the packet for Sarah Cushing, and next day I sent it from Belfast. There you have the whole truth of it. You can hang me or do what you like with me, but you cannot punish me as I've been punished already. I cannot shut my eyes, but I see those two faces staring at me, staring at me as they stared when my boat broke through the haze. I killed them quick, but they're killing me slow, and if I have another night of it I shall be either mad or dead before morning. You won't put me alone into a cell, sir. For pity's sake, don't, and may you be treated in your day of agony as you treat me now." "'What is the meaning of it, Watson?' said Holmes solemnly, as he laid down the paper. "'What object is served by this circle of misery and violence and fear? But it must tend to some end, or else our universe is ruled by chance, which is unthinkable. But what end?' There is the great standing perennial problem to which human reason is as far from an answer as ever. End of section three.
Section four of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Slipperfox recording is in the public domain. Section four The Adventure of the Red Circle Part one Doctor Watson read by Corrie Samuel Sherlock Holmes read by Beth Thomas Mrs Warren read by Marianne Spiegel Gennaro Luca read by Arnaldo Machado Emilia Luca read by Ethel Bus Inspector Gregson, read by James Callahan. Leverton, read by Levi Throckmorton. Well, Mrs. Warren, I cannot say that you have any particular cause for uneasiness, nor do I understand why I, whose time is of some value, should interfere in the matter. I rarely have other things to engage me. So spoke Sherlock Holmes, and turned back to the great scrapbook, in which he was arranging and indexing some of his recent material but the landlady had the pertinacity and also the cunning of her sex. She held her ground firmly. "'You arranged an affair for a lodger of mine last year,' she said. "'Mr. Fairdale Hobbs.' "'Ah, yes, a simple matter.' "'But he would never cease talking of it. Your kindness, sir, and the way in which you brought light into the darkness. I remembered his words when I was in doubt and darkness myself. I know you could—' if you only would." Holmes was accessible upon the side of flattery, and also, to do him justice, upon the side of kindliness. The two forces made him lay down his gum-brush with a sigh of resignation and push back his chair. "'Well, well, Mrs. Warren, let us hear about it, then. You don't object to tobacco, I take it? Thank you, Watson, the matches. You are uneasy, as I understand, because your new lodger remains in his rooms, and you cannot see him. Why, bless you, Mrs. Warren, if I were your lodger, you would often not see me for weeks on end. No doubt, sir, but this is different. It frightens me, Mr. Holmes. I can't sleep for fright. To hear his quick step moving here and moving there from early morning to late at night, and yet never to catch so much as a glimpse of him, it's more than I can stand. My husband is as nervous over it as I am but he is out at his work all day, while I get no rest from it. What is he hiding for? What has he done? Except for the girl, I am all alone in the house with him, and it's more than my nerves can stand." Holmes leaned forward and laid his long, thin fingers upon the woman's shoulder. He had an almost hypnotic power of soothing when he wished. The scared look faded from her eyes, and her agitated features smoothed into their usual commonplace. She sat down in the chair which he had indicated. "'If I take it up, I must understand every detail,' said he. "'Take time to consider. The smallest point may be the most essential. You say that the man came ten days ago, and paid you for a fortnight's board and lodging?' "'He asked my terms, sir. I said fifty shillings a week. There's a small sitting-room, and a bedroom, and all complete, at the top of the house." Well? He said, I'll pay you five pounds a week, if I can have it on my own terms. I'm a poor woman, sir, and Mr. Warren earns little, and the money meant much to me. He took out a ten-pound note, and he held it out to me, then and there. You can have the same every fortnight for a long time to come, if you keep the terms," he said. If not, I'll have no more to do with you. What were the terms? Well, sir, they were that he was to have a key of the house. That was all right. Lodgers often have them. Also, he was to be left entirely to himself and never, upon any excuse, to be disturbed. Nothing wonderful in that, surely. Not in reason, sir. But this is out of all reason. He has been there for ten days, and neither Mr. Warren, nor I, nor the girl has once set eyes upon him. We can hear that quick step of his pacing up and down, up and down, night, morning, and noon. But except on that first night, he had never once gone out of the house. Oh, he went out the first night, did he? Yes, sir, and returned very late, after we were all in bed. He told me after he had taken rooms that he would do so, and asked me not to bar the door. I heard him come up the stair after midnight. 
but his meals it was his particular direction that we should always when he rang leave his meal upon a chair outside his door then he rings again when he has finished and we take it down from the same chair if he wants anything else he prints it on a slip of paper and leaves it prints it yes sir prints it in pencil just the word nothing more here's the one i brought to show you soap here's another match this is the one he left the first morning daily gazette i leave that paper with his breakfast every morning dear me watson said holmes staring with great curiosity at the slips of foolscap which the landlady had handed to him this is certainly a little unusual seclusion i can understand but why print printing is a clumsy process why not write what would it suggest watson that he desired to conceal his handwriting but why what can it matter to him that his landlady should have a word of his writing still it may be as you say then again why such laconic messages i cannot imagine it opens a pleasing field for intelligent speculation the words are written with a broad pointed violet tinted pencil of a not unusual pattern you will observe that the paper is torn away at the side here after the printing was done so that the s of soap is partly gone suggestive watson is it not of caution exactly there was evidently some mark some thumbprint something which might give a clue to the person's identity now mrs warren you say that the man was of middle size dark and bearded what age would he be youngish sir not over thirty well can you give me no further indication he spoke good english sir and yet i thought he was a foreigner by his accent and he was well dressed very smartly dressed sir quite the gentleman dark clothes nothing you would note he gave no name no sir and has had no letters or callers none but surely you or the girl enter his room of a morning no sir he looks after himself entirely dear me that is certainly remarkable what about his luggage he had one big brown bag with him nothing else well we don't seem to have much material to help us do you say nothing has come out of that room absolutely nothing the landlady drew an envelope from her bag from it she shook out two burnt matches and a cigarette end upon the table they were on his tray this morning i brought them because i had heard that you can read great things out of small ones holmes shrugged his shoulders there is nothing here said he the matches have of course been used to light cigarettes that is obvious from the shortness of the burnt end half the match is consumed in lighting a pipe or cigar but dear me this cigarette stub is certainly remarkable the gentleman was bearded and moustached you say yes sir i don't understand that i should say that only a clean-shaven man could have smoked this why watson even your modest moustache would have been singed a holder i suggested no no the end is matted i suppose there could not be two people in your rooms mrs warren no sir he eats so little that i often wonder it can keep life in one well i think we must wait for a little more material after all you have nothing to complain of you have received your rent and he is not a troublesome lodger though he is certainly an unusual one he pays you well and if he chooses to lie concealed it is no direct business of yours we have no excuse for an intrusion upon his privacy until we have some reason to think that there is a guilty reason for it i have taken up the matter and i won't lose sight of it report to me if anything fresh occurs and rely upon my assistance if it should be needed there are certainly some points of interest in this case watson he remarked when the landlady had left us it may of course be trivial individual eccentricity or it may be very much deeper than appears on the surface the first thing that strikes one is the obvious possibility that the person now in the rooms may be entirely different from the one who engaged them why should you think so well apart from the cigarette end was it not suggestive that the only time the lodger went out was immediately after his taking the rooms he came back or some one came back when all the witnesses were out of the way 
we have no proof that the person who came back was the person who went out then again the man who took the room spoke english well this other however prints match when it should have been matches i can imagine that the word was taken out of a dictionary which would give the noun but not the plural the laconic style may be to conceal the absence of knowledge of english yes watson there are good reasons to suspect that there has been a substitution of lodgers but for what possible end ah there lies our problem there is one rather obvious line of investigation he took down the great book in which day by day he filed the agony columns of the various london journals dear me said he turning over the pages what a chorus of groans cries and bleatings what a rag-bag of singular happenings but surely the most valuable hunting-ground that ever was given to a student of the unusual this person is alone and cannot be approached by letter without a breach of that absolute secrecy which is desired how is any news or any message to reach him from without obviously by advertisement through a newspaper there seems no other way and fortunately we need concern ourselves with the one paper only here are the daily gazette extracts of the last fortnight lady with a black boa at prince's skating club that we may pass surely jimmy will not break his mother's heart that appears to be irrelevant if the lady who fainted on brixton bus oh she does not interest me every day my heart longs bleat watson unmitigated bleat ah this is a little more possible listen to this be patient we'll find some sure means of communications meanwhile this column g that is two days after mrs warren's lodger arrived it sounds plausible does it not the mysterious one could understand english even if he could not print it let us see if we can pick up the trace again yes here we are three days later in making successful arrangements patience and prudence the clouds will pass g nothing for a week after that then comes something much more definite the path is clearing if i find chance signal message remember code agreed one a two b and so on you will hear soon g that was in yesterday's paper and there is nothing in today's it's all very appropriate to mrs warren's lodger if we wait a little watson i don't doubt that the affair will grow more intelligible so it proved for in the morning i found my friend standing on the hearth-rug with his back to the fire and a smile of complete satisfaction upon his face how's this watson he cried picking up the paper from the table high red house with white stone facings third floor second window left after dusk g that is definite enough i think after breakfast we must make a little reconnaissance of mrs warren's neighbourhood ah mrs warren what news do you bring us this morning our client had suddenly burst into the room with an explosive energy which told of some new and momentous development it's a police matter mr holmes she cried i'll have no more of it he shall pack out of there with his baggage i would have gone straight up and told him so only i thought it was but fair to you to take your opinion first but i'm at the end of my patience and when it comes to knocking my old man about knocking mr warren about using him roughly anyway but who used him roughly ha ah, that's what we want to know it was this morning sir mr warren is a timekeeper at morton and waylight's in tottingham court road he has to be out of the house before seven well this morning he had not gone ten paces down the road when two men came up behind him threw a coat over his head and bundled him into a cab that was beside the curb they drove him an hour and then opened the door and shot him out he lay in the roadway so shaken in his wits that he never saw what became of the cab when he picked himself up he found he was in hampstead heath so he took a bus home and there he lies now on his sofa while i came straight round to tell you what had happened most interesting said holmes did he observe the appearance of these men did he hear them talk no he is clean dazed he just knows that he was lifted up as if by magic and dropped as if by magic two at the least were in it and maybe three and you connect this attack with your lodger well 
we've lived there fifteen years and no such happenings ever came before i've had enough of him money's not everything i'll have him out of my house before the day is done wait a bit mrs warren do nothing rash i begin to think that this affair may be much more important than appeared at first sight it is clear now that some danger is threatening your lodger it is equally clear that his enemies lying in wait for him near your door mistook your husband for him in the foggy morning light on discovering their mistake they released him what they would have done had it not been a mistake we can only conjecture well what am i to do mr holmes i have a great fancy to see this lodger of yours mrs warren i don't see how that is to be managed unless you break in the door I always hear him unlock it as I go down the stair after I leave the tray. He has to take the tray in. Surely we could conceal ourselves and see him do it? The landlady thought for a moment. Well, sir, there's a box room opposite. I could arrange a looking glass. Maybe. And if you were behind the door. Excellent, said Holmes. When does he lunch? About one, sir. Then Dr. Watson and I will come around in time. For the present, Mrs. Warren, good-bye. At half-past twelve we found ourselves upon the steps of Mrs. Warren's house, a high, thin, yellow-brick edifice in Great Orm Street, a narrow thoroughfare at the northeast side of the British Museum. Standing as it does near the corner of the street, it commands a view down Howe Street, with its more pretentious houses. Holmes pointed with a chuckle to one of these, a row of residential flats, which projected so that they could not fail to catch the eye. "'See, Watson,' said he, "'high red house with stone facings. There is the signal station, all right. We know the place and we know the code, so surely our task should be simple. There's a to-let card in that window. It is evidently an empty flat to which the Confederate has access. Well, Mrs. Warren, what now?' "'I have it all ready for you.' if you will both come up and leave your boots below on the landing. I'll put you there now." It was an excellent hiding-place which she had arranged. The mirror was so placed that, seated in the dark, we could very plainly see the door opposite. We had hardly settled down in it, and Mrs. Warren left us, when a distant tinkle announced that our mysterious neighbour had rung. Presently the landlady appeared with the tray, laid it down upon a chair beside the closed door, and then, treading heavily, departed. Crouching together in the angle of the door, we kept our eyes fixed upon the mirror. Suddenly, as the landlady's footsteps died away, there was the creak of a turning key, the handle revolved, and two thin hands darted out and lifted the tray from the chair. An instant later it was hurriedly replaced, and I caught a glimpse of a dark, beautiful, horrified face glaring at the narrow opening of the box-room. Then the door crashed too, the key turned once more, and all was silence. Holmes twitched my sleeve, and together we stole down the stair. "'I will call again in the evening,' said he to the expectant landlady. "'I think, Watson, we can discuss this business better in our own quarters.' "'My surmise, as you saw, proved to be correct,' said he, speaking from the depths of his easy-chair. "'There has been a substitution of lodgers. What I did not foresee is that we should find a woman, and no ordinary woman, Watson. She saw us. Well, she saw something to alarm her, that is certain. The general sequence of events is pretty clear, is it not? A couple seek refuge in London from a very terrible and instant danger. The measure of that danger is the rigour of their precautions. The man, who has some work which he must do, desires to leave the woman in absolute safety while he does it it is not an easy problem but he solved it in an original fashion and so effectively that her presence was not even known to the landlady who supplies her with food the printed messages as is now evident were to prevent her sex being discovered by her writing the man cannot come near the woman or he will guide their enemies to her since he cannot communicate with her direct he has recourse to the agony column of a paper so far all is clear but what is at the root of it Ah, yes, Watson, severely practical as usual. What is at the root of it all? Mrs. Warren's whimsical problem enlarges somewhat, and assumes a more sinister aspect as we proceed. 
this much we can say that it is no ordinary love escapade you saw the woman's face at the sign of danger we have heard too of the attack upon the landlord which was undoubtedly meant for the lodger these alarms and the desperate need for secrecy argue that the matter is one of life or death the attack upon mr warren further shows that the enemy whoever they are are themselves not aware of the substitution of the female lodger for the male it is very curious and complex watson why should you go further in it what have you to gain from it what indeed it is art for art's sake watson i suppose when you doctored you found yourself studying cases without thought of a fee for my education holmes education never ends watson it is a series of lessons with the greatest for the last this is an instructive case there is neither money nor credit in it and yet one would wish to tidy it up when dusk comes we should find ourselves one stage advanced in our investigation when we returned to mrs warren's rooms the gloom of a london winter evening had thickened into one grey curtain a dead monotone of colour broken only by the sharp yellow squares of the windows and the blurred halos of the gas lamps as we peered from the darkened sitting-room of the lodging-house one more dim light glimmered high up through the obscurity someone is moving in that room said holmes in a whisper his gaunt and eager face thrust forward to the window-pane yes i can see his shadow there he is again he has a candle in his hand now he is peering across he wants to be sure that she is on the lookout now he begins to flash take the message also watson that we may check each other a single flash that is a surely now then how many did you make it twenty so did i that should mean t a t that's intelligible enough another t surely this is the beginning of a second word now then t n t a stop that can't be all watson a tenter gives no sense nor is it any better as three words at ten ta unless t a are a person's initials there it goes again what's that a t t e why it is the same message over again curious watson very curious now he is off once more a t he is repeating it for the third time a tenter three times how often will he repeat it no that seems to be the finish he has withdrawn from the window what do you make of it watson a cipher message holmes my companion gave a sudden chuckle of comprehension and not a very obscure cipher watson said he why of course it is italian the a means that it is addressed to a woman beware 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 how's that watson i believe you have hit it not a doubt of it it is a very urgent message thrice repeated to make it more so but beware of what wait a bit he is coming to the window once more again we saw the dim silhouette of a crouching man and the whisk of the small flame across the window as the signals were renewed they came more rapidly than before so rapid that it was hard to follow them pericolo pericolo eh what's that watson danger isn't it yes by jove it's a danger signal there he goes again peri hello what on earth the light had suddenly gone out the glimmering square of window had disappeared and the third floor formed a dark band round the lofty building with its tiers of shining casements that last warning cry had been suddenly cut short how and by whom the same thought occurred on the instant to us both holmes sprang up from where he crouched by the window this is serious watson he cried there is some devilry going forward why should such a message stop in such a way i should put scotland yard in touch with this business and yet it is too pressing for us to leave shall i go for the police we must define the situation a little more clearly it may bear some more innocent interpretation come watson let us go across ourselves and see what we can make of it End of section four. Section five of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Section five. The Adventure of the Red Circle. Part two. As we walked rapidly down Howell Street, I glanced back at the building which we had left. There dimly outlined at the top window i could see the shadow of a head 
a woman's head, gazing tensely, rigidly, out into the night, waiting with breathless suspense for the renewal of that interrupted message. At the doorway of the House Street flats a man, muffled in a cravat and greatcoat, was leaning against the railing. He started as the whole light fell upon our faces. "'Holmes!' he cried. "'Why, Gregson,' said my companion, as he shook hands with the Scotland Yard detective. "'Journeys end with lovers' meetings. What brings you here?' "'The same reasons that bring you, I expect,' said Gregson. "'How you got on to it, I can't imagine.' different threads but leading up to the same tangle i've been taking the signals signals yes from that window they broke off in the middle we came over to see the reason but since it is safe in your hands i see no object in continuing this business wait a bit cried gregson eagerly i'll do you this justice mr holmes that i was never in a case yet that i didn't feel stronger for having you on my side there's only the one exit to these flats so we have him safe. Who is he? Well, well, we score over you for once, Mr. Holmes. You must give us best this time. He struck his stick sharply upon the ground, on which a cabman, his whip in his hand, sauntered over from a four-wheeler which stood on the far side of the street. May I introduce you to Mr. Sherlock Holmes? He said to the cabman. This is Mr. Leverton of Pinkerton's American Agency. "'The hero of the Long Island Cave Mystery,' said Holmes. "'Sir, I am pleased to meet you.' The American, a quiet, business-like young man, with a clean-shaven, hatchet face, flushed up at the words of commendation. "'I am on the trail of my life now, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'If I can get Gorgiano.' "'What? Gorgiano, of the Red Circle?' "'Oh, he has a European fame, has he?' Well, we've learned all about him in America. We know he is at the bottom of fifty murders, and yet we have nothing positive we can take him on. I tracked him over from New York, and I've been close to him for a week in London, waiting some excuse to get my hand on his collar. Mr. Gregson and I ran him to ground in that big tenement house, and there's only one door, so he can't slip us. There's three folk come out since he went in, but I'll swear he wasn't one of them. Mr. Holmes talks of signals, said Gregson. I expect, as usual, he knows a good deal that we don't." In a few clear words Holmes explained the situation as it had appeared to us. The American struck his hands together with vexation. "'He's on to us,' he cried. "'Why do you think so?' "'Well, it figures out that way, does it not? Here he is, sending out messages to an accomplice. There are several of his gang in London. Then suddenly, just as by your own account he was telling them that there was danger, he broke short off. What could it mean except that from the window he had suddenly either caught sight of us in the street, or in some way come to understand how close the danger was, and that he must act right away if he was to avoid it? What do you suggest, Mr. Holmes? That we go up at once and see for ourselves. But we have no warrant for his arrest. He is in unoccupied premises under suspicious circumstances, said Gregson. That is good enough for the moment. When we have him by the heels, we can see if New York can't help us to keep him. I'll take the responsibility of arresting him now." Our official detectives may blunder in the matter of intelligence, but never in that of courage. Gregson climbed the stair to arrest this desperate murderer, with the same absolutely quiet and business-like bearing with which he would have ascended the official staircase of Scotland Yard. The Pinkerton man had tried to push past him but Gregson had firmly elbowed him back. London dangers were the privilege of the London force. The door of the left-hand flat upon the third landing was standing ajar. Gregson pushed it open. Within all was absolute silence and darkness. I struck a match and lit the detective's lantern. As I did so, and as the flicker steadied into a flame, we all gave a gasp of surprise. On the deal boards of the carpetless floor there was outlined a fresh track of blood. The red steps pointed towards us and led away from an inner room, the door of which was closed. Gregson flung it open and held his light full blaze in front of him, while we all peered eagerly over his shoulders. In the middle of the floor of the empty room was huddled the figure of an enormous man, 
his clean-shaven, swarthy face grotesquely horrible in its contortion, and his head encircled by a ghastly crimson halo of blood, lying in a broad wet circle upon the white woodwork. His knees were drawn up, his hands thrown out in agony, and from the centre of his broad, brown, upturned throat there projected the white haft of a knife driven blade deep into his body. Giant as he was, the man must have gone down like a pole-axed ox before that terrific blow. Beside his right hand a most formidable horn-handled two-edged dagger lay upon the floor, and near it a black kid glove. "'By George! It's Black Gorgiano himself!' cried the American detective. "'Someone has got ahead of us this time.' "'Here is the candle in the window, Mr. Holmes,' said Gregson. "'Why, whatever are you doing?' Holmes had stepped across, had lit the candle, and was passing it backward and forward across the window-panes. Then he peered into the darkness, blew the candle out, and threw it on the floor. "'I rather think that will be helpful,' said he. He came over and stood in deep thought while the two professionals were examining the body. "'You say that three people came out from the flat while you were waiting downstairs. Did you observe them closely?' Yes, I did. Was there a fellow about thirty, black-bearded, dark, of middle size? Yes, he was the last to pass me. That is your man, I fancy. I can give you his description, and we have a very excellent outline of his footmark. That should be enough for you. Well, not much, Mr. Holmes, among the millions of London. Perhaps not. That is why I thought it best to summon this lady to your aid. We all turned round at the words. There, framed in the doorway, was a tall and beautiful woman, the mysterious lodger of Bloomsbury. Slowly she advanced, her face pale and drawn with a frightful apprehension, her eyes fixed and staring, her terrified gaze riveted upon the dark figure on the floor. "'You have killed him,' she muttered. Oh, dear me, you have killed him. Then I heard a sharp intake of her breath, and she sprang into the air with a cry of joy. Round and round the room she danced, her hands clapping, her dark eyes gleaming with delighted wonder, and a thousand pretty Italian exclamations pouring from her lips. It was terrible and amazing to see such a woman so convulsed with joy at such a sight. Suddenly she stopped, and gazed at us all with a questioning stare. "'But you, you are police, are you not? You have killed Giuseppe Corgiano. Is it not so?' "'We are police, madam.' She looked round into the shadows of the room. "'But where, then, is Gennaro?' she asked. "'He's my husband, Gennaro Luca. I am Emilia Luca, and we are both from New York. Where is Gennaro?' He called me this moment from this window, and I ran with all my speed. It was I who called, said Holmes. You? How could you call? Your cipher was not difficult, madam. Your presence here was desirable. I knew that I had only to flash Vieni, and you would surely come. The beautiful Italian looked with awe at my companion. I do not understand how you know these things she said. Giuseppe Gorgiano, how did he? She paused, and then suddenly her face lit up with pride and delight. Oh, now I see it, my Gennaro, my splendid, beautiful Gennaro, who has guarded me safe from no harm. He did it. With his own strong hands, he killed the monster. Oh, Gennaro, how wonderful you are. What woman could ever be worthy of a, such a man? Well, Mrs. Luca, said the prosaic Gregson, laying his hand upon the lady's sleeve with as little sentiment as if she were a Notting Hill hooligan. I am not very clear yet who you are or what you are, but you have said enough to make it very clear that we shall want you at the yard. One moment, Gregson, said Holmes. I rather fancy that this lady may be as anxious to give us information as we can be to get it. You understand, madam, that your husband will be arrested and tried for the death of the man who lies before us. 
what you say may be used in evidence but if you think that he has acted from motives which are not criminal and which he would wish to have known then you cannot serve him better than by telling us the whole story now that gordiano is dead we fear nothing said the lady he was a devil and a monster and there can be no judge in the world who would punish my husband for have killed him in that case said holmes my suggestion is that we lock this door leave things as we found them go with this lady to her room and form our opinion after we have heard what it is that she has to say to us half an hour later we were seated all four in the small sitting-room of signora luca listening to her remarkable narrative of those sinister events the ending of which we had chanced to witness she spoke in rapid and fluent but very unconventional english which for the sake of clearness i will make grammatical i was born in posilipo near naples said she and was the daughter of augusto barelli who was the chief lawyer and also the deputy of that part Gennaro was in my father's employment and i came to love him as any woman must he had neither money nor position nothing but his beauty and strength and energy so my father forbade the match we fled together we married at Paris, and sold my jewels to gain the money which would take us to america this was four years ago and we have been in new york ever since fortune was very good to us at first Gennaro was able to do a service to a italian gentleman he saved him from some ruffians in the place called the boweri and so made a powerful friend his name was tito castellotti and he was the senior partner of the great firm of castellotti and zamba who are the chief fruit importers of new york signor zamba is an invalid and our new friend castellotti has a power within the firm which employs more than three hundred men he took my husband into his employment made him head of the department and showed him good will towards him in every way signor castellotti was a bachelor and i believe that he felt as if Gennaro was his son and both my husband and i loved him as if he were our father we had taken a furnished a little house in brooklyn and our whole future seemed assured when that black cloud appeared which was soon to overspread our sky one night when Gennaro returned from his work he brought a fellow countryman back with him his name was gorgiano and he had come out from posilipo he was a huge man as you can testify for you have looked upon his corpse not only was his body that of a giant but everything about him was grotesque gigantic and terrifying his voice was like thunder in our little house there was scarce room for the whir of his great arms as he talked his thoughts his emotions his passions all were exaggerated and monstrous he talked or rather roared with such energy that others could but sit and listen coward with the might stream of words his eyes blazed at you and held you with his mercy he was terrible and wonderful man i thank god that he is dead he came again and again yet i was aware that Gennad was no more happy than i was in his presence ah my poor husband would sit pale and listless listening to the endless raving upon politics and upon social questions with made-up or visitors conversation Gennaro said nothing but i who knew him so well could read in his face some emotion which i had never seen there before at first i thought that it was dislike and then gradually i understood that it was more than dislike it was fear a deep secret shrinking fear that night the night that i read his terror i put my arms round him and i implored him by his love for me and by all that he held dear to hold nothing from me and to tell me why this huge man overshadowed him so he told me 
and my own heart grew cold as ice as i listened my poor Gennaro in his wild and fiery days when all the world seemed against him and his mind was driven half mad by the injustice of life had joined a neapolitan society the red circle which was allied to the old carbonari the oath and secret of this brotherhood was frightful but once within its rule no escape was possible when we had fled to america gennaro thought that he had cast in all off forever what was his horror when even to meet in the street the very man who had initiated him in naples the giant gorgiano a man who had earned the name of death in the south of italy for he was red to the elbow in murder he had come to new york to avoid the italian police and he had already planted a branch of this dreadful society in his new home all this gennaro told me and showed me a summons we had received that very day a red circle draw upon the head of it telling him that the lodge would be held upon a certain date and that his presence at it was required and ordered that was bad enough but worse was to come i had noticed for some time that when gorgiano came to us as he constantly did in the evening he spoke much to me and even when his words were to my husband those terrible glaring white beast eyes of his were always turned upon me one night his secret came out i had awakened that he called love with him the love of a brute a savage gennaro had not yet returned when he came he pushed his way in seized me in his might arms hugged me in his bare embrace covered me with kisses and implored me to come away with him i was struggling and screaming when gennaro entered and attacked him he struck gennaro senseless and fled from the house which he was never more to enter it was a deadly enemy that we made the night a few days later came the meeting gennaro returned from it with a face which told me that something dreadful had occurred it was worse than we could have imagined possible the funds of the society were raised by blackmailing rich italians and threatening them with violence should they refuse the money it seems that castellot our dear friend and benefactor had been approached he had refused to yield the threats and he had handed a notice to the police it was resolved now that such an example should be made of them as would prevent any other victim from rebelling at the meeting it was arranged that he and his house should be blow up with dynamite there was a drawing of lots as to who should carry out the deed gennaro saw our enemy's cruel face smiling at him and he dipped his hand in the bag no doubt it had been prehended in some fashion for it was the fatal disc with the red circle upon it the mandate for the murder which lay upon his palm he was to kill his best friend or he was to expose himself and me to the vengeance of these comrades it was part of their fiendish system to punish those whom they feared or hated by injuring not only their own persons but those who they loved and it was the knowledge of this which hung as a terror over my poor gennaro's head and drove him nearly crazy with apprehension all that night we sat together our arms round each other each is threatening each for the troubles that lay before us the very next evening had been fixed for the tempt by midday my husband and i were on our way to london but not before he had given our benefactor full warning of this danger and had also left such information for the police as would safeguard his life for the future the rest gentlemen 
you know for yourselves we are sure that our enemies would be behind us like our own shadows gorgiano has his private reasons for vengeance but in any case we knew how ruthless cunning and untiring he could be both italy and america are full of stories of his dreadful powers if ever they were deserted it would be now my darling made use of the few clear days which our start had given us in arranging for the refuge for me in such a fashion that no possible danger could reach me for his own part he wished to be free that he might communicate both with the american and with the italian police i do not myself know where he lived or how all that i learned was through the columns of a newspaper but once as i looked through my window i saw two italians watching the rouse and understood that in some way gorgiano had found a retreat finally gennaro told me through the paper that he would signal to me from a certain window but when the signals came they were nothing but warnings which were suddenly interrupted it's very clear to me now that he knew gorgiano to be close upon him and that thank god he was ready for him when he came and now gentlemen i would ask you whether we have anything to fear from the law or whether any judge upon earth would condemn my Gennaro for what he has done. Well, Mr. Gregson, said the American, looking across at the official, I don't know what your British point of view may be, but I guess that in New York this lady's husband will receive a pretty general vote of thanks. She'll have to come with me and see the chief, Gregson answered. If what she says is corroborated, I do not think she or her husband has much to fear. But what I can't make head or tail of, Mr. Holmes, is how on earth you got yourself mixed up in the matter. Education, Gregson. Education. Still seeking knowledge at the old university. Well, Watson, you have one more specimen of the tragic and grotesque to add to your collection. By the way, it is not eight o'clock, and a Wagner night at Covent Garden. If we hurry, we might be in time for the second act. End of section five. Section six of His Last Bow by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section six. The Adventure of the Bruce Partington Plans. Part one. Dr. Watson read by Corrie Samuel. Sherlock Holmes read by Beth Thomas. Mycroft Holmes read by Eden Ray Hedrick. Inspector Lestrade read by Natalie Paula. Colonel Valentine Walter read by todd miss violet westbury read by shakira searle railway officer by norman elfer butler to sir james read by brian mancy mr sidney johnson read by francis brown in the third week of november in the year eighteen ninety five a dense yellow fog settled down upon london from the Monday to the Thursday I doubt whether it was ever possible from our windows in Baker Street to see the loom of the opposite houses. The first day Holmes had spent in cross-indexing his huge book of references. The second and third had been patiently occupied upon a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when, for the fourth time, after pushing back our chairs from breakfast, we saw the greasy, heavy brown swirl still drifting past us, and condensing in oily drops upon the window-panes. My comrades' impatient and active nature could endure this drab existence no longer. He paced restlessly about our sitting-room in a fever of suppressed energy, biting his nails, tapping the furniture, and chafing against inaction. "'Nothing of interest in the paper, Watson,' he said. I was aware that, by anything of interest, Holmes meant anything of criminal interest. There was the news of a revolution, of a possible war, and of an impending change of government, but these did not come within the horizon of my companion. I could see nothing recorded in the shape of crime which was not commonplace and futile. Holmes groaned and resumed his restless meanderings. "'The London criminal is certainly a dull fellow.' 
said he, in the querulous voice of the sportsman whose game has failed him. Look at this window, Watson. See how the figures loom up, are dimly seen, and then blend once more into the cloud-bank. The thief or the murderer could roam London on such a day as the tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces, and then evident only to his victim. There have, said I, been numerous petty thefts. Holmes snorted his contempt. This great and sombre stage is set for something more worthy than that. It is fortunate for this community that I am not a criminal. It is indeed, said I heartily. Suppose that I were Brooks or Woodhouse, or any of the fifty men who have good reason for taking my life, how long could I survive against my own pursuit? A summons, a bogus appointment, and all would be over. It is well they don't have days of fog. In the Latin countries, the countries of assassination, by Jove, here comes something at last to break our dead monotony. It was the maid with a telegram. Holmes tore it open and burst out laughing. "'Well, well, what next?' said he. "'Brother Mycroft is coming around.' "'Why not?' I asked. "'Why not? It is as if you met a tram-car coming down a country lane. Mycroft has his rails, and he runs on them. His Pall Mall lodgings, the Diogenes Club, Whitehall, that is his cycle. Once, and only once, he has been here. What upheaval can possibly have derailed him?' "'Does he not explain?' Holmes handed me his brother's telegram. "'Must see you over Cadogan West. Coming at once. Mycroft.' "'Cadogan West? I have heard the name.' It recalled nothing to my mind, but that Mycroft should break out in this erratic fashion, a planet might as well leave its orbit. By the way, do you know what Mycroft is?' I had some vague recollection of an explanation at the time of the adventure of the Greek interpreter. You told me that he had some small office under the British government." Holmes chuckled. "'I did not know you quite so well in those days. One has to be discreet when one talks of high matters of state. You are right in thinking that he is under the British government. You would also be right in a sense if you said that occasionally he is the British government." "'My dear Holmes!' "'I thought I might surprise you. Mycroft draws four hundred and fifty pounds a year, remains a subordinate, has no ambitions of any kind, will receive neither honour nor title, but remains the most indispensable man in the country. But how? Well, his position is unique. He has made it for himself. There has never been anything like it before, nor will be again. He has the tidiest and most orderly brain, with the greatest capacity for storing facts of any man living. The same great powers which I have turned to the detection of crime, he has used for this particular business. The conclusions of every department are passed to him, and he is the central exchange, the clearing-house, which makes out the balance. All other men are specialists, but his specialism is omniscience. We will suppose that a minister needs information as to a point which involves the Navy, India, Canada, and the bimetallic question. He could get his separate advices from various departments upon each but only Mycroft can focus them all, and say offhand how each factor would affect the other. They began by using him as a shortcut, convenience. Now he has made himself an essential. In that great brain of his everything is pigeonholed, and can be handed out in an instant. Again and again his word has decided the national policy. He lives in it. He thinks of nothing else, save when, as an intellectual exercise, he unbends if I call upon him and ask him to advise me on one of my little problems. But Jupiter is descending to-day. What on earth can it mean? Who is Cadogan West, and what is he to Mycroft?" "'I have it!' I cried, and plunged among the litter of papers upon the sofa. "'Yes, yes, here he is, sure enough. Cadogan West was the young man who was found dead on the underground on Tuesday morning." Holmes sat up at attention, his pipe halfway to his lips. "'This must be serious, Watson. A death which has caused my brother to alter his habits can be no ordinary one. What in the world can he have to do with it? The case was featureless, as I remember it. The young man had apparently fallen out of the train and killed himself. He had not been robbed, and there was no particular reason to suspect violence. Is that not so?" "'There has been an inquest,' said I, "'and a good many fresh facts have come out. Looked at more closely, I should certainly say that it was a curious case.' 
judging by its effect upon my brother i should think it must be a most extraordinary one he snuggled down in his armchair now watson let us have the facts the man's name was arthur cadogan west he was twenty-seven years of age unmarried and a clerk at woolwich arsenal government employ behold the link with brother mycroft he left woolwich suddenly on monday night was last seen by his fiancée, Miss Violet Westbury, whom he left abruptly in the fog about seven-thirty that evening. There was no quarrel between them, and she can give no motive for his action. The next thing heard of him was when his dead body was discovered by a plate-layer named Mason, just outside Aldgate Station on the underground system in London. When? The body was found at six on Tuesday morning. It was lying wide of the metals upon the left hand of the track as one goes eastward, at a point close to the station, where the line emerges from the tunnel in which it runs. The head was badly crushed, an injury which might well have been caused by a fall from the train. The body could only have come on the line in that way. Had it been carried down from any neighbouring street, it must have passed the station barriers, where a collector is always standing. This point seems absolutely certain. Very good. The case is definite enough. The man, dead or alive, either fell or was precipitated from a train. So much is clear to me. Continue." The trains which traverse the lines of rail beside which the body was found are those which run from west to east, some being purely metropolitan, and some from Willesden and outlying junctions. It can be stated for certain that this young man, when he met his death, was travelling in this direction at some late hour of the night, but at what point he entered the train it is impossible to state. His ticket, of course, would show that. There was no ticket in his pockets. No ticket? Dear me, Watson, this is really very singular. According to my experience, it is not possible to reach the platform of a metropolitan train without exhibiting one's ticket. Presumably, then, the young man had one. Was it taken from him in order to conceal the station from which he came? It is possible. Or did he drop it in the carriage? That is also possible. But the point is of curious interest. I understand that there was no sign of robbery. Apparently not. There is a list here of his possessions. His purse contained two pounds fifteen. He had also a cheque-book on the Woolwich branch of the Capital and Counties Bank. Through this his identity was established. There were also two dress-circle tickets for the Woolwich Theatre, dated for that very evening. Also a small packet of technical papers. Holmes gave an exclamation of satisfaction. There we have it at last, Watson. British Government, Woolwich. Arsenal, technical papers, Brother Mycroft. The chain is complete. But here he comes, if I am not mistaken, to speak for himself. A moment later the tall and portly form of Mycroft Holmes was ushered into the room. Heavily built and massive, there was a suggestion of uncouth physical inertia in the figure, but above this unwieldy frame there was perched a head so masterful in its brow, so alert in its steel-grey, deep-set eyes, so firm in its lips, and so subtle in its play of expression, that after the first glance one forgot the gross body, and remembered only the dominant mind. At his heels came our old friend Lestrade of Scotland Yard, thin and austere. The gravity of both their faces foretold some weighty quest. The detective shook hands without a word. Mycroft Holmes struggled out of his overcoat and subsided into an armchair. "'A most annoying business, Sherlock,' said he. "'I extremely dislike altering my habits, but the powers that be would take no denial. In the present state of Siam it is most awkward that I should be away from the office. But it is a real crisis. I have never seen the Prime Minister so upset. As to the Admiralty, it is buzzing like an overturned beehive. Have you read up the case?' "'We have just done so.' What were the technical papers? Ah, there's the point. Fortunately, it has not come out. The press would be furious if it did. The papers which this wretched youth had in his pocket were the plans of the Bruce Partington submarine. Mycroft Holmes spoke with a solemnity which showed his sense of the importance of the subject. His brother and I sat expectant. Surely you have heard of it. I thought everyone had heard of it. Only as a name. Its importance can hardly be exaggerated. It has been the most jealously guarded of all government secrets. 
You may take it from me that naval warfare becomes impossible within the radius of a Bruce Partington's operation. Two years ago, a very large sum was smuggled through the estimates, and was expended in acquiring a monopoly of the invention. Every effort has been made to keep the secret. The plans, which are exceedingly intricate, comprising some thirty separate patents, each essential to the working of the whole, are kept in an elaborate safe in a confidential office adjoining the arsenal, with burglar-proof doors and windows. Under no conceivable circumstances were the plans to be taken from the office. If the chief constructor of the navy desired to consult them, even he was forced to go to the Woolwich office for the purpose. And yet, here we find them in the pocket of a dead junior clerk in the heart of London. From an official point of view, it's simply awful. But you have recovered them? No, Sherlock, no, that's the pinch. We have not. Ten papers were taken from Woolwich. There were seven in the pocket of Cadogan West. The three most essential are gone, stolen, vanished. You must drop everything, Sherlock. Never mind your usual petty puzzles of the police court. It's a vital international problem that you have to solve. Why did Cadogan West take the papers? Where are the missing ones? How did he die? How came his body where it was found? How can the evil be set right? Find an answer to all these questions, and you will have done good service for your country. Why do you not solve it yourself, Mycroft? You can see as far as I. Possibly, Sherlock, but it is a question of getting details. Give me your details, and from an armchair I will return you an excellent expert opinion. But to run here and run there, to cross-question railway guards, and lie on my face with a lens to my eye, it is not my métier. No, you are the one man who can clear the matter up. If you have a fancy to see your name in the next honours list— My friend smiled and shook his head. I play the game for the game's own sake, said he. But the problem certainly presents some points of interest, and I shall be very pleased to look into it. Some more facts, please. I have jotted down the most essential ones upon this sheet of paper, together with a few addresses which you will find of service. The actual official guardian of the papers is the famous government expert, Sir James Walter, whose decorations and subtitles fill two lines of a book of reference. He has grown grey in the service, is a gentleman, a favoured guest in the most exalted houses, and, above all, a man whose patriotism is beyond suspicion. He is one of two who have a key of the safe. I may add that the papers were undoubtedly in the office during working hours on Monday, and that Sir James left for London about three o'clock, taking his key with him. He was at the house of Admiral Sinclair at Barclay Street during the whole of the evening when this incident occurred. Has the fact been verified? Yes. His brother, Colonel Valentine Walter, has testified to his departure from Woolwich, and Admiral Sinclair to his arrival in London. So Sir James is no longer a direct factor in the problem. Who was the other man with the key? The senior clerk and draughtsman, Mr. Sidney Johnson. He is a man of forty, married, with five children. He is a silent, morose man, but he has, on the whole, an excellent record in the public service. He is unpopular with his colleagues, but a hard worker. According to his own account, corroborated only by the word of his wife, he was at home the whole of Monday evening, after office hours, and his key has never left the watch-chain upon which it hangs. Tell us about Cadogan West. He has been ten years in the service, and has done good work. He has the reputation of being hot-headed and imperious, but a straight, honest man. We have nothing against him. He was next Sidney Johnson in the office. His duties brought him into daily personal contact with the plans. No one else has had the handling of them. Who locked up the plans that night? Mr. Sidney Johnson, the senior clerk. Well, it is surely perfectly clear who took them away. They are actually found upon the person of this junior clerk, Cadogan West. That seems final, does it not? It does, Sherlock, and yet it leaves so much unexplained. In the first place, why did he take them? I presume they were of value? He could have gotten several thousand for them very easily. Can you suggest any possible motive for taking the papers to London except to sell them? No, I cannot. Then we must take that as our working hypothesis. Young West took the papers. Now this could only be done by having a false key. Several false keys. He had to open the building and the room. He had then several false keys. He took the papers to London to sell the secret, intending, no doubt, to have the plans themselves back in the safe next morning before they were missed. While in London on this treasonable mission, he met his end. How? We will suppose that he was travelling back to Woolwich when he was killed and thrown out of the compartment. 
Aldgate, where the body was found, is considerably past the station London Bridge, which would be his route to Woolwich. Many circumstances could be imagined under which he would pass London Bridge. There was someone in the carriage, for example, with whom he was having an absorbing interview. This interview led to a violent scene in which he lost his life. Possibly he tried to leave the carriage, fell out on the line, and so met his end. The other closed the door, there was a thick fog, and nothing could be seen. No better explanation can be given with our present knowledge, and yet consider, Sherlock, how much you leave untouched. We will suppose, for argument's sake, that young Cadogan West had determined to convey these papers to London. He would naturally have made an appointment with a foreign agent, and kept his evening clear. Instead of that, he took two tickets for the theatre, escorted his fiancée halfway there, and then suddenly disappeared. A blind? said Lestrade, who had sat listening with some impatience to the conversation. A very singular one. That is objection number one. Objection number two. We will suppose that he reaches London and sees the foreign agent. He must bring back the papers before morning or the loss will be discovered. He took away ten. Only seven were in his pocket. What had become of the other three? He certainly would not leave them of his own free will. Then again, where is the price of his treason? One would have expected to find a large sum of money in his pocket. "'It seems to me perfectly clear,' said Lestrade. "'I have no doubt at all as to what occurred. He took some papers to sell them. He saw the agent. They could not agree as to a price. He started home again, but the agent went with him. In the train the agent murdered him, took the more essential papers, and threw his body from the carriage. That would account for everything, would it not?' "'Why had he no ticket?' The ticket would have shown which station was nearest the agent's house. Therefore, he took it from the murdered man's pocket. "'Good, Lestrade, very good,' said Holmes. "'Your theory holds together. But if this is true, then the case is at an end. On the one hand, the traitor is dead. On the other, the plans of the Bruce Partington submarine are presumably already on the continent. What is there for us to do?' "'To act, Sherlock, to act!' cried Mycroft, springing to his feet. All my instincts are against this explanation. Use your powers. Go to the scene of the crime. See the people concerned. Leave no stone unturned. In all your career you have never had so great a chance of serving your country." "'Well, well,' said Holmes, shrugging his shoulders. "'Come, Watson. And you, Lestrade, could you favour us with your company for an hour or two? We will begin our investigation by a visit to Oldgate Station. Good-bye, Mycroft. I shall let you have a report before evening, but I warn you in advance that you have little to expect." An hour later, Holmes, Lestrade, and I stood upon the Underground Railroad, at the point where it emerges from the tunnel immediately before Aldgate Station. A courteous, red-faced old gentleman represented the railway company. "'This is where the young man's body lay,' said he, indicating a spot about three feet from the metals. "'It could not have fallen from above, for these, as you see, are all blank walls. Therefore it could only have come from a train, and that train so far as we can trace it, must have passed about midnight on Monday. Have the carriages been examined for any sign of violence? There are no such signs, and no ticket has been found. No record of a door being found open? None. We have had some fresh evidence this morning, said Lestrade. A passenger who passed Allgate in an ordinary metropolitan train about 11.40 on Monday night declares that he heard a heavy thud, as of a body striking the line, just before the train reached the station. There was a dense fog, however, and nothing could be seen. He made no report of it at the time. Why, whatever's the matter, Mr. Holmes?" My friend was standing with an expression of strained intensity upon his face, staring at the railway metals where they curved out of the tunnel. Aldgate is a junction, and there was a network of points. On these his eager, questioning eyes were fixed, and I saw on his keen, alert face that tightening of the lips, that quiver of the nostrils, and concentration of the heavy, tufted brows, which I knew so well. "'Points,' he muttered. "'The points.' "'What of it? What do you mean?' "'I suppose there are no great number of points on a system such as this.' "'No, there are very few.' and a curve, too, points and a curve, by Jove, if it were only so. What is it, Mr. Holmes? Have you a clue? An idea, an indication, no more. But the case certainly grows in interest, unique, perfectly unique, and yet why not? I do not see any indications of bleeding on the line. 
There were hardly any. But I understand that there was a considerable wound. The bone was crushed, but there was no great external injury. And yet one would have expected some bleeding. Would it be possible for me to inspect the train which contained the passenger who heard the thud of a fall in the fog? I fear not, Mr. Holmes. The train has been broken up before now, and the carriages redistributed. I can assure you, Mr. Holmes, said Lestrade, that every carriage has been carefully examined. I saw it to it myself. It was one of my friend's most obvious weaknesses that he was impatient with less alert intelligences than his own. Very likely, said he, turning away. As it happens, it was not the carriages which I desired to examine. Watson, we have done all we can here. We need not trouble you any further, Mr. Lestrade. I think our investigations must now carry us to Woolwich. At London Bridge, Holmes wrote a telegram to his brother, which he handed to me before dispatching it. It ran thus. See some light in the darkness, but it may possibly flicker out. Meanwhile, please send by messenger, to await return at Baker Street, a complete list of all foreign spies or international agents known to be in England, with full address. Sherlock. That should be helpful, Watson, he remarked, as we took our seats in the Woolwich train. We certainly owe Brother Mycroft a debt for having introduced us to what promises to be a really very remarkable case. His eager face still wore that expression of intense and high-strung energy, which showed me that some novel and suggestive circumstance had opened up a stimulating line of thought. See the foxhound with hanging ears and drooping tail as it lolls about the kennels, and compare it with the same hound as, with gleaming eyes and straining muscles, it runs upon a breast-high scent. Such was the change in Holmes since the morning. He was a different man from the limp and lounging figure in the mouse-coloured dressing-gown, who had prowled so restlessly only a few hours before round the fog-girt room. "'There is material here, there is scope,' said he. "'I am dull indeed not to have understood its possibilities.' "'Even now they are dark to me.' "'The end is dark to me also. But I have hold of one idea which may lead us far. The man met his death elsewhere, and his body was on the roof of a carriage.' "'On the roof?' Remarkable, is it not? But consider the facts. Is it a coincidence that it is found at the very point where the train pitches and sways as it comes round on the points? Is not that the place where an object upon the roof might be expected to fall off? The points would affect no object inside the train. Either the body fell from the roof, or a very curious coincidence has occurred. But now consider the question of the blood. Of course there was no bleeding on the line if the body had bled elsewhere. Each fact is suggestive in itself. Together they have a cumulative force. And the ticket, too! I cried. Exactly! We could not explain the absence of a ticket. This would explain it. Everything fits together. But suppose it were so. We are still as far from ever from unravelling the mystery of his death. Indeed, it becomes not simpler, but stranger. Perhaps, said Holmes thoughtfully. Perhaps. He relapsed into a silent reverie, which lasted until the slow train drew up at last in Woolwich Station. There he called a cab and drew Mycroft's paper from his pocket. We have quite a little round of afternoon calls to make, said he. I think that Sir James Walter claims our first attention. The house of the famous official was a fine villa with green lawns stretching down to the Thames. As we reached it, the fog was lifting, and a thin, watery sunshine was breaking through. A butler answered our ring. "'Sir James, sir,' said he, with solemn face. "'Sir James died this morning.' "'Good heavens!' cried Holmes in amazement. "'How did he die?' "'Perhaps you would care to step in, sir, and see his brother, Colonel Valentine.' "'Yes, we had best do so.' We were ushered into a dim-lit drawing-room, where an instant later we were joined by a very tall, handsome, light-bearded man of fifty, the younger brother of the dead scientist. His wild eyes, stained cheeks and unkempt hair, all spoke of the sudden blow which had fallen upon the household. He was hardly articulate as he spoke of it. "'It was this horrible scandal,' said he. "'My brother, 
sir james was a man of very sensitive honour and he could not survive such an affair it broke his heart he was always so proud of the efficiency of his department and this was a crushing blow we had hoped that he might have given us some indications which would have helped us to clear the matter up i assure you that it was all a mystery to him as it is to you and to all of us he had already put all his knowledge at the disposal of the police naturally he had no doubt that cottigan west was guilty but all the rest was inconceivable you cannot throw any new light upon the affair i know nothing myself save what i have read or heard i have no desire to be discourteous but you can understand mr holmes that we are much disturbed at present and i must ask you to hasten this interview to an end this is indeed an unexpected development said my friend when we had regained the cab i wonder if the death was natural or whether the poor fellow killed himself if the latter may it be taken as some sign of self-reproach for duty neglected we must leave that question to the future now we shall turn to the cadogan wests a small but well-kept house in the outskirts of the town sheltered the bereaved mother the old lady was too dazed with grief to be of any use to us but at her side was a white-faced young lady who introduced herself as miss violet westbury the fiancée of the dead man and the last to see him upon that fatal night i cannot explain it mr holmes she said i have not shut an eye since the tragedy thinking 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 night and day what the true meaning of it can be arthur was the most single-minded chivalrous patriotic man upon earth he would have cut his right hand off before he would sell a state secret confided to his keeping it is absurd impossible preposterous to any one who knew him but the facts miss westbury yes yes i admit i cannot explain them was he in any want of money no his needs were very simple and his salary ample he had saved a few hundreds and we were to marry at the new year no sign of any mental excitement come miss westbury be absolutely frank with us the quick eye of my companion had noted some change in her manner she coloured and hesitated yes she said at last i had a feeling that there was something on his mind for long only for the last week or so he was thoughtful and worried once i pressed him about it he admitted that there was something and that it was concerned with his official life it is too serious for me to speak about even to you said he i could get nothing more holmes looked grave go on miss westbury even if it seems to tell against him go on we cannot say what it may lead to indeed i have nothing more to tell once or twice it seemed that he was on the point of telling me something he spoke one evening of the importance of the secret and i have some recollection that he said no doubt foreign spies would pay a great deal to have it my friend's face grew graver still anything else he said that we were slack about such matters that it would be easy for a traitor to get the plans was it only recently that he made such remarks yes quite recently now tell us of that last evening we were to go to the theatre the fog was so thick that a cab was useless we walked and our way took us close to the office suddenly he darted away into the fog without a word he gave an exclamation that was all i waited but he never returned then i walked home next morning after the office opened they came to inquire about twelve o'clock we heard the terrible news oh mr holmes if you could only only save his honour it was so much to him holmes shook his head sadly come watson said he our ways lie elsewhere our next station must be the office from which the papers were taken it was black enough before against this young man but our inquiries make it blacker 
he remarked as the cab lumbered off his coming marriage gives a motive for the crime he naturally wanted money the idea was in his head since he spoke about it he nearly made the girl an accomplice in the treason by telling her his plans it is all very bad but surely holmes character goes for something then again why should he leave the girl in the street and dart away to commit a felony exactly there are certainly objections but it is a formidable case which they have to meet End of section 6